So what are we talking about today? We're talking about politics versus philosophy, right? Politics is the relationship you're having with like government, right? Your country, your city, your state, your county. You're having a relationship with the people that are governing you. And we vote for those people. We vote for certain things to happen as a community. And therefore, I think the country is a reflection. The politics is a reflection of the country, right? Philosophy is the study of the fundamental nature of knowledge and beliefs in existing and existence. Philosophy is the why and politics is the how, right? That's how I think of it. I think of philosophy as the why of me, the consciousness of the world and its consciousness. And then I think of politics as the how that consciousness moves forward in the world and like works as a society. So if you're looking at philosophy, meaning like like to know, you're really having an individual experience in relation to existence. If you're talking about politics, you're talking about a group activity. You can't politics alone. You know what I mean? You politics with people. So the problem is, is that when you go on that introspective journey to understand yourself fundamentally as a human, as a consciousness, you're having like an individual relationship. And then that usually overlaps with society, how you treat others, how you treat your spouse or your parents or your people at school or work, which brings in the politics. And then there's like a gap you have to bridge. And that's really difficult because we're socialized creatures and we like people and we're meant to be in herds and we're meant to socialize in a positive way and feel accepted. And so the politics of your city, state, county, country pushes you in a direction right? The politics of the situation makes you um, feel a certain way about yourself, encourages you to think about your yourself in a certain way, right? So again, the politics is the thing we're doing as a collective and the philosophy is the thing you're doing as the individual. But then philosophy gets political and people start identifying with philosoph like philosophy concepts, right? They, I'm a nihilist. I'm I believe in stoicism. Oh, I'm an objectivist, Rand. Like they start identifying and making philosophy political. Not that philosophy was without politics or whatever. You can go back to Socrates. Obviously, it's very political. It's very philosophy. I get it. But think about it in those ways. I like to separate it just for like the sake of conversation, okay? I like to separate it into those two things. So again, the dilemma we're having and the dilemma I think I have in conveying my ideas to you and to YouTube is that in order for me to humanize people around me and not just wish that I lived alone on the planet constantly, which I technically do harbor that inner thought <laughs> because the world doesn't change just because I changed, right? I harbor this inner thought of like, oh my gosh, I wish I lived alone on an island because humans are so frustrating, right? They rape each other. They assault each other. They steal from one another. They murder each other. They abuse their children. They cheat on each other. They lie to each other. There's so many things about humans that are just so scary, which is why humans gonna human is a slogan to humanize people in the situation. So you recognize and don't freak out when you're like, oh my gosh, this human is a monster. They're not monsters. They're humans. They're a monster of a human, but they're still human. So every time you tell yourself, oh, that's not even a human, that's not even a man, that's not even a woman, that's a monster, you're forgetting that you are that thing. I am you and you are me. Nobody chose what house they were born into, what gender they were born into, nothing. We are just here to experience life and to make decisions depending on what level of like uh, consciousness we have, right? So again, it's exhausting to recognize that you're sitting on a planet sharing space with people and those people are going to come together and they're going to politics your civil rights away. They're going to justify torturing you for the sake of their agenda. And it's going to come from all kinds of people with all kinds of labels. So it's not really about conservative versus liberal, but it is a nice way to like pretend that, that it's as simple as that, right? I recently saw a video of, you know, one of those shows where they go talk to conservatives and the conservatives were like talking about how like slavery was actually really good for the slaves. It really helped them, right? And you're sitting here like, um, maybe not, right? Oof, I've got a little bit of a, ooh, of a headache. I gotta take off my hair thingy. Oh my gosh. Okay, so, ooh, oh, that helps so much. I got one of those pressure headaches. Okay, so, Again, you see these interviews and you see these conservatives be like, yes, slavery, I think slavery did a lot actually for the slaves because um, 
you know, it really gave them like a sense of resilience and it really, it really gave them a place to be and uh, people housed and clothed them. And you're sitting here like, um, um, okay. So again, there is a group of people, there is a bubble that thinks because things basically turned out okay, it's justified. I'll give you an example that often um, happens in my life. And again, it very frustrates me because I feel like, how am I miscommunicating this? How am I literally miscommunicating this? As you guys know, I come from uh, an immigrant family. My parents are from Iraq and um, my family has a very controversial sort of background. My grandma, my mom's mom, uh, was like married at like 12 years old to my grandpa. And they both didn't want to get married, but their families were kind of very much like, you need to do this for the survival of the family, to make boys, to keep the village going. And they're Assyrian and they're Catholic and a primarily Iraq Muslim country. So you marry not only your cousins, but you marry at very young ages. And obviously this is very bad, right? And obviously the nuance is that both of them were victims of the circumstance because neither, neither of them wanted to be there. But if they hadn't done it, the consequences would have been much greater. So they did what they did. They were very good friends and they made it work. They had like 17 kids together. They had my mother. Um, I knew my grandparents till they died. I love my grandparents. I had less of a relationship with my grandma because she got Alzheimer's when I was really young. So I didn't really know her consciousness, but I got to hang out with her on occasion in the hospital. And one of the things that people take from this story is sometimes they'll say, oh my gosh, wow, that's so sad. I can't believe she endured that. He endured that. I'm like, yeah, it is sad. But you know, they made the best out of it. And so people will be like, oh, they made the best out of it. See, sometimes uh, child brides do work. No, 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 no. Don't hear me wrong. Making children into brides and grooms doesn't work because it basically turned out okay. Lots of quotations here. Lots of asterisks. It was never okay to make children into brides. And if you did it for survival reasons, which a lot of bubbles are doing, lots of people are just surviving. So they're justifying child brides or they're justifying abusing their children or they're justifying the abuse they cause each other. They're justifying lying and cheating and all these things. I get it. I so get it. But it's still wrong. And I don't want people to think that just because you were surviving it justified the action so much as it was an understandable choice because you didn't understand you had other options. And maybe you literally didn't in some instances, right? So I want I want to make sure, and I wrote a note here, like not everyone is doing, let's say child brides for the worst reason, but no one is doing it for the best or healthiest reason. Nobody is creating a child bride because that's the healthiest thing to do, right? Like, that is not what's happening. And if you think the survival of the human species is so important, we need to breed children, you need to upgrade your PC, okay? You need to upgrade because that mentality is so weirdly caveman to me, I can't even process it. Now, I understand in places on earth, there are villages, people, people like my ancestors who, who felt like this was the only option they had. It's, it's not the only option. It's just the one you think is the only option because you don't even have the tools to consider something else. And I want you to consider something else, right? So one of the frustrations that I have is that people will hear me tell my story and they'll think I'm justifying child brides. Quite the contrary. The nuance is that despite something horrible happening to you, you can survive. It shouldn't be repeated. We should stop it. We should condemn it and we should talk about the bad of it, but we can understand that it happens and we can understand that people aren't forever tainted because they went through something in a survival situation, but it can't be justified. You cannot justify a child bride, right? So I want to make it clear that when I'm talking and I'm saying, oh, this is like a bubble and this is what they're doing. Humans are going to human. What I'm doing is I'm radically accepting that like, oh, people are going to do people things. And even though I think it's insane to them, this is what they think is normal. Well, how, why do I think I'm normal? And why do they think they're normal? And then what does normal mean? Right? 
So we're having like a very specific relationship with this information. This is the 112th episode of Money Ground, and we want you to help us decide what the next 112 episodes will be. Join our Money Ground Patreon the community volume. and make Money Ground with us. I was chosen to read the following prompt. White Americans have way more advantages than black Americans. I think I'm a rarity here. It would seem so. Do white Americans white have more Americans advantages? Have more why do white Americans have way more advantages than black Americans? Mm. So already we're talking about a game. Which game are we playing? We're playing the American game, obviously. And we're playing the game related to our skin color. I don't want to say like a specific background because like what is white? What is black? Right? Like Destiny's half Cuban. What does that mean? I'm Middle Eastern, but I'm white. Like what does that mean? So, okay, let's let's see what game we're going to be talking about, because, again, advantages in which game? They're white or do just white Americans have advantages because of historic factors? Um, I think that people want to argue at the end of the day over whether it's because you're white or not. I think that the answer is because you're white in the past. And that's how it kind of carries over to today. You know, even in times of the United States history where black people tried to build wealth, you, you know, with uh, the Tulsa riots and everything where, yeah, mm -hmm. they, that this wealth has been destroyed. And mm -hmm. something that's upsetting to me is when conservatives talk about how that's. Sorry, when you think of the Tulsa riots, you're thinking of a time in which the game turned violent and the game was strategic. So again, I don't think a lot of conservatives know about these things. I certainly didn't grow, I didn't know these things growing up. So you have in your mind like, oh, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which I know I'm very independent, like girl boss attitude. But I want to make it clear that like no one does anything alone, that we rely on our communities, rely on resources, we rely on families, we rely on education systems, we rely on our government. We rely on our communities to be good to us. And when our communities aren't good to us and they stop us from getting ahead, that that is strategic and that is that is targeted, right? So it's specific. We can't blame the past for what's happening in the present. That is true to some extent. But then the next breath, they'll talk about how important it is to have dual parent households, how important it, has, it is to have a strong family, to have responsibility passed on from parent to child. And we've seen in the past that because of racial issues, that process has been severely disrupted. The funny thing is, is that agreeing with all these things is when I did my research when I was younger, which arrived me to my standpoint of being a conservative because I believed it was racist, Democrat, liberal ideologies and policies dating all the way back to the 1800s, all the way up to the 1960s, and then you, the purported big switch. But I think it was more so when Democrats decided to be a bit more cloak and dagger about their true opinions of black people and be more uh, secretive and more, oh, we want to help you by, you know, doing these things and seeing them as a barrier. I think that people forget like politics is messy and dark and dirty. And I think people forget like politics is about winning and politics is about sometimes winning at any cost. And so, of course, pandering to your people is a part of it, manipulating them to vote for you, um, making people want like telling it's weird because politicians are in a really weird place. It's like when you're the leader of anything, you can't make everyone happy. So someone's going to be unhappy, but who gets to be the unhappy group? And hopefully it isn't a targeted group. Hopefully it's just like a scatter of specific people who happen to not be represented in government. But throughout American history, throughout world history, it's usually like targeted groups. So it'd be one thing if the world just like it is what it is and some people end up poor. I think that's true. But I think it's clear that some people end up poor because they're targeted and some people end up poor because like that's just the way like their family history went right and it's not because they were targeted and that's the difference is like the why and so when you think about it from a philosophy perspective you're asking yourself like what are my values and is that ever represented in the government and how do I make a reality that is makes sense with the fact that politics is about winning and usually philosophy is about the knowledge of the why the knowledge of existence and existing. And those things often don't coincide, right? Again, I've been involved in politics too much n to know that everyone's kind of grifting, everyone's lying. And so that's the dilemma is that we can't even agree on what's true. So like we're not going to get as far, far as you think you're going to get. So usually because we can't agree on what's true, we usually agree on the goal. That's why conservatives have the reputation of being very good at coming together to attain a goal. And the left liberals have problems because we have a lot of infighting. But the reality is, is that because some of us are still like naively hoping that like the truth gets represented and then some people are just like, fuck the truth, like let's just win. Let's win the game. And so that's a part of the dilemma. So in this circumstance, I've had these moments where, you know, you realize the people who are supposed to help you and invest in you, they don't. Political, like leftists are just as bad, in my opinion, as political conservatives. They're just the Oh my God, I want to sound like such a Republican. 
they're just the better of the two politicians, the two quote unquote evils, right? I grew up hearing that my whole life. Vote for the best of two evils. I I would rather not, which is why I didn't vote for Biden or or Trump last year. But at the same time, like, what is a politician? What is a politician? I'm not going to be a politician because it would make me do things that would violate my values. Most people are more than happy to be politicians because their values are usually easily paid off or they're they're open to the the game of politics, right? I think people who have this naive idea that if you're a politician, you can be like a, a super ethical one is weird to me. It's just like a weird idea. Even AOC, if you watch her journey, and I was like a huge AOC fan in the beginning, it's like if you watch her journey, she's had to play the game. There is a game to be played. And it's fine because that's the game. That's the game she's in. That's the bubble. But that's the problem. We're never going to have like a society that's built off truth and honesty and beauty. We're only ever going to have a society of people that can get together and at best not hurt each other in direct ways like murder. We can't even do that, by the way. Hence Tulsa riots. Like we can't even get to the point yet where we're not murdering each other over politics like the woman who was just killed with the gay flag in her store. So again, I'm not trying to reach for this like utopia because like that's not a real thing. I'm trying to say like, well, how do I manage as a consciousness to accept that this is life? That our society comes together through politics and we as a society vote for people to represent us. And at the same time, like it's never quite as honest and transparent as beautiful as we want it to be. I think you, for me, I recognize that, well, first I had to decide like, what am I doing on the planet? And I really do think I'm just like an evolved animal on this planet. I don't think I'm obligated to some God to act a certain way or even to a certain country. I'm only obligated to adhere to the, mm, to my values, but obviously to this, I'm, I'm, I think I'm obligated to treat myself kindly in some way, but that's my value. So I'm obligated in some ways to treat myself kindly. So I should be aware of the rules and the laws and the politics of where I'm at, right? Like Croatia is really great. I love living here, but it's very Catholic. And they recently made gay marriage illegal, the constitutionally illegal. They wanted to make sure people knew like we Catholic. And that sucks. That sucks that as a queer person, I'm living in a country that's anti-gay. But they're also a religious country. And so you have to pick the pros and cons. It's better to live in Croatia right now for a lot more reasons than the U.S. But like that does suck that I live in a country that's anti-gay marriage. There's no way around it. There's nowhere on this planet whose government could like perfectly represent my beliefs or, or my values. So I have to pick and choose because it's not just Britney on this planet. I share this planet with other people. So politicians are in this like weirdly hard place where – they can't even give everyone what they want because that wouldn't work. <clears throat> but we can't also agree yet on how to come together to like harm reduce because not everyone agrees on what harm looks like, right? Especially not in a world where people are literally saying slavery had its perks for slaves. Like we can't even agree that slavery was bad. We can't even agree that child brides are bad, like bad, bad, like shouldn't do it. We can't even agree that denying your six-year-old food for lunch is bad. And you want to live in a world where you think like your YouTube video or your YouTube panel or you do, your Jubilee video is going to what? Shift culture? Like, I, what are we talking about here? Uh, affirmative action, welfare, all sorts so of wait, things welfare. that eventually so, ruin our culture and places where we are now. So but, giving, but, but I want to I get back to the history of it because we're talking about... Well, I just want to make sure we're clear. Giving them money hurt them, right? Is that what you're a, saying? Well, yes, giving them because if your father's out of the home, that's when we give you the money. If you're living yeah, in this so, housing, so then give them the money while the dad's in the home. Well, then give them the money while the dad's in the home. If you're, if you're working so this amount of the, hours and getting blessed in this amount of you're dollars, throwing, you're getting money. You're from throwing the, the baby. Yes, it is you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I don't even know what that means in this scenario because yes, you're, you're okay, throwing. Okay, you want to talk about throwing babies out with the bathwater? Margaret Sanger wanted to exterminate the black race because she thought they were weeds. So yeah, we can literally talk about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That's what Margaret Sanger. That's what Democrat policies wanted to do to my people. So that's why I feel so strongly about it because it is these policies that date back centuries that were built off of the death and poverty of my people. Let's take a breath. So. I'm breathing. Okay. So a lot of babies aren't, but aren't, I am, sadly. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what that means. When I say throw the baby out with the bathwater, you want to completely get rid of welfare, okay? Or at least the conservative, I don't want to put that on you, you haven't said that, but the conservative apparatus does, clearly. So giving money to a group of people does not hurt them. I mean, it sure, can't. you're talking about a lottery, just take, take money. But yes. there are, there are strings take attached money. to that money. Take all the there money. Are... Mm. Again, 
politics, their solution will be like, give everyone money. Conservative solution is don't give them money and don't help them either. My solution is ask yourself why you exist on this planet and what are you obligated to do? Are you at least obligated to treat yourself with kindness? And my whole thing, I'm sorry I'm eating my chocolate, but I really have to eat it for this headache. Um, My whole thing is to encourage people to say to themselves, even if I was given this money, how am I really going to utilize it to benefit myself? Look, as somebody who has seen it happen time and time again, anecdotal, I know, when you get tons of money, it doesn't guarantee your success. Money is a tool. And unless you know how to use that tool, it's kind of worthless. Even something as like a million dollars. Do you guys know the story about the little kid who sings on the Disney movie uh, um, Lion King? The little voice for Simba, his singing voice, they were given a, a, a deal from Disney. They could either get a million dollars lump sum up front or they could get residuals over time for everything that he would be involved in in the future. And his parents, very brightly, chose not the million dollars, but getting paid over time. And now he is worth so much more money than he ever could have been if he took that milli. And a million, if a million dollars, okay, if a home in Orange County, California is a million dollars for a suburb home, what good is a million dollars? What good is it? Like, it's a lot of money. But if you just go buy one house, you're done. You're back to zero. And you still have the house. It's a big deal because you might be like thinking, oh, I don't even have a house. Mm -mm. As somebody who knows just a little bit about money, getting a lump sum is never going to be the answer. But having a relationship with that lump sum, knowing what to do with it, understanding it. I had um, a caller once and uh, I don't remember how it came up. But they were talking about, you know, problem solving their couple stuff, right? And we were talking about money and we were talking about basically like, okay, if you got a lump sum, like what would you do with it? And it was a test to see like where they were in their relationship in terms of maturity with money. And, you know, one person was like, let's save it. And the other person was like, let's spend it on a vacation. There was this, there's always this temptation to be like, I'm suffering. I don't have enough money. But when I get money, the first thing I do is think about ways to spend it. And that's just people. That's me. I have been there so many times. I have been there. I'm not great with money, as you guys know, because I just decided to stop unaliving myself like three, four years ago. So again, people have to understand, like when you get a lump sum, if you don't have a long term goal and you're very serious about it, you'll just spend it. So, yeah, in some ways, giving people money is not going to help. But the money you're getting from welfare, it's not the thing that's keeping you from succeeding. I know so many people on disability, so many people on welfare, and they were never the people. And I mean this with with the I mean this in the nicest way. They're like a multiple categories. OK, they were in one category is that they are the people that benefit the most and just needed a leg up, and now they're very successful. I know those people. The other group, the one that everyone, I think, needs to have a better relationship with is the group of people who are never going to do anything. They're never going to need more than welfare money. They're never going to be, like, they're never going to have the motivation to do more. Um, I have a couple of relatives that way. Like, they had welfare babies. That's their shtick. That's their thing. And you might not like it, but... I don't think it matters that much whether you like it or not, because to be honest with you, from the military to welfare spending, like we're all overspending to credit card debt to everything else. These are symptoms of a system. They're symptoms. They didn't exist before. They exist now. So again, you can be upset that people are on welfare, but I think that's a symptom. And those are kinds of people. Some people use welfare because they don't have aspirations to do anything else and they never were going to do it anyways. They were never going to do it because if they were going to do it, they would have gotten off welfare and done it. But it's not that simple. It's very hard. And most people choose the easy route, myself included. I chose a route that to other people is hard, but to me is easy. Working seven days a week, easy. Not working at all drives me crazy. Literally, I would rather be working (laughs) than not working. But It's a benefit to me. Like my weird brain actually benefits me because I'm willing to work. But other people, like they can't work. It's not a part of their thing. Actually, 85% of people with autism in the US don't work. It's hard. It takes too many spoons. It's exhausting. It's very difficult for them. And I feel like, yeah, that kind of makes sense if it's too much. I knew a guy, a dad, I nannied for a family 
and it was like step siblings, um, step family. So I was dealing with like six parents. And one of the dads was on welfare for his illness. I, th I think there might be a different term for it. He had DID. And he goes, hey, really conservative state. So he was like, hey, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but I have a thing called DID. And I was like, oh, yeah, I know what that is. And he was like, oh, really? I was like, yeah. Like I I looked at him. I was like, I come from a, a, a bubble that knows what mental health, like it's mentally health aware. Like I know what mental illness, like I, I know it. So we're good. And he's like, oh, okay, cool. So I knew how it worked. I knew how to help him. I knew how it impact his kids maybe. I knew, I knew how to have the conversation with him. And the parents were so relieved. They were like, oh, my gosh. Oh, good. We don't have to explain this to her. She's not going to look at him like he's a freak. And I was like, nah. And I loved the government had a program for him to basically stay at home all day. And he was pretty responsible with the money. He maintained his apartment. He maintained his time with his kids. But he wasn't a person just looking at him, not just because of the DID. There was other factors. But like he wasn't a human that was going to pull himself up by the bootstraps. He's exactly the kind of human that we need these programs for. So I'm a big fan of the programs because I think they work for the right people. And the people that take advantage of them, I don't care. Everyone is taking advantage of everything. And I don't believe you when you say you don't, right? I just don't believe you. I've seen enough conservatives cut corners in business and y'all get caught all the time. Don't tell me that people can't cut corners when it comes to welfare. Like, I just don't believe you. You know what I mean? Um, I'm reading your comments, by the way. If I see one um, that will that I should read out loud, I will. Um, but I do appreciate them. Please keep sending them. Almost all conservatives think slavery is bad. There's a misrepresented piece of history curriculum saying slaves found ways to better themselves through grit despite horrific circumstances. Everyone can better themselves when they survive horrific circumstances, like the Jews in the Holocaust. Can we all agree that that's not a reason to ever justify or be lenient on the fact that it happened in history? Again, it happened and it never should have happened. You know, parents do this all the time. They justify the way, the pain they put their kids through because it will make them stronger. If you're watching One Piece like I am, don't spoil it. Luffy just met his grandpa and his, he was afraid of him. Like Luffy had trauma from his grandpa. He's like, every time you're around me, you just hurt me. And he's like, I'm making you a stronger man. Though his grandpa is lovable, he tortured Luffy and Luffy is afraid of him for a good reason. So you know what I mean? Like there's something to be said about that specific kind of bubble in which they torture their children or grandkids to make them tougher. It's not OK. And yeah, maybe it made Luffy a better fighter. Maybe it made me a better person. Um, Still not OK. Right. The ends don't always justify the means. And I think some people are way too focused on, well, at least you're, look how tough you are. I am an amazing person despite the BS I went through. Despite it, not because of it. Strings attached Give them to millions. Money. Make them all millionaires. I don't care. Giving money to black people does not hurt them. And that, and ha that has not that. happened, though. That has not happened. What, what do you mean? That has not happened. Giving, no. It hasn't been a referee. You're saying it hasn't been this so or that. What I, it you're saying welfare program, welfare was designed. Society, Zach, that welfare was built was, off of the idea of, hey, we get these families split up. We get these So then let them here. keep the family together and keep all the money. I mean, I guess Boom. so, but I'm, I guarantee you there, I guess there's so. no way Why that would happen. you not advocate for that? So in your, I guess, research of, like, history of this country and everything, do you find like the reconstruction era and like the failures of like what it wanted to be and then what it ended up being um and then which led into you know which you know had downstream effects to, to enter into the jim crow era and you know you have policies like redlining that influence you know how schools are funded the downstream effects of slavery do you think um put black people as ge and generally in a worse opposition than white americans i think generation by generation the effects of slavery have been diluted but generation by generation the effects of racism welfare-based policies and things of that nature became even more great so in the 1880s or so when we had our first black members of congress which were indeed republicans i think that was a great start for things but obviously we had terrible things that happened like the tulsa massacre uh among you know black people being chased out of their homes by the kkk sure all funded by the democrat party all supported by the democrat okay, party well, I, I mean i need to stop you there uh can you attribute not to the party but to the ideology because i think when you think Regardless of what, whatever the party switch was, traditionally conservative values did not like. That's more aligned with, um, you know, uh, uh, more racist policies it's in this very country. Like to very compare twenty twenties conservatism to eighteen eighties conservatism. I, I think this is like, even like, <sighs> okay, mm. Mm. okay. From my understanding of how 
humans tend to be, anecdotal, people will believe anything that sounds good and coincides with their one anecdotal experience in life, which is fair, right? And I think when you say like, oh, there's been a party switch and the Democrats did this and the Republicans did this, again, the labels shouldn't be what we're referring to. I agree with this guy with glasses. It's more like the ideologies that we're referring to. And I think that certain groups of people, certain bubbles do justify things. So when I say like as a queer person, like, yeah, if you're voting anti-LGBT, if you're voting Republican, you're voting my, you know, anti my civil rights, you could be a Republican that doesn't care about LGBT stuff at all. You're actually pro-gay, but you need to vote Republican because you need something out of the Republican Party. That's okay. You're still voting anti-civil rights. Like it, it doesn't matter if you if you know that's not why you're voting by because you have to vote Republican to get what you want, you're still voting anti my civil liberties, which is your prerogative. You're allowed to be invested in your specific future, right? So I will say, again, the nuance is that I understand that we're all out for ourselves. And in some ways, that's probably better because the world, as you can see, is not invested in your well-being. And frankly, I don't think any of us are actually capable of being invested in most people's well-being. It's too much work. But it is what's happening. And so then you have to ask yourself, am I voting within my values? And so for Brittany, I tend to go civil rights over dollar bill. But I find that a lot of libertarians and Republicans and conservatives who are pro-LGBT vote dollar bill over civil liberties, which is like, again, you're right. But I just don't value money that much because I think value like money is a tool and money is like not the point. And I think about, again, my consciousness in the universe. And then I remember like the politics of money is weird and money is just like a means to an end. And yes, I want to work all the time because I like my job, but also I need to make money and it's like very confusing. And so my goal is always to like live very humbly so I don't have to play the money game. Like I'm not trying to get a Bugatti over here. Because again, in order to become very, very wealthy in this country, in America, I do think you tend to be less ethical the richer you get. Not that I'm super anti-billionaires or anything, but I mean like it's great like become a billionaire, but also I do question how you got there. I question famous people. I question people in positions of power. How did you get there? I question a lot of people when they have a status that's very high. Like, how'd you get there? What did you do? Whose hands did you shake? Who are you friends with? Because it's all about networking, right? But who are you networking with? You have to be good at networking. Like, one of the reasons I I swear to God, I'll never be able to do politics is because like, I'm just like, oh, I don't like that you're doing that. And in politics, you can't tell people you don't like something. You just have to turn a blind eye and go along with it. Because like, There is an unsaid rule about networking and who's going to promote who and who's going to be your friend. So again, like this, this black kid, I, I get this, this narrative. I hear it a lot. Like Democrats voted against my rights. Yes. People who identify as Democrats. So again, in present day, it's not about Democrat versus Republican. It is about the people with the ideals that represent with this label we call Republican or conservative or Democrat. Like, look, when the progressives call everyone a white nationalist, I usually tune it out because, again, for me, white nationalist is a very specific identity. Like white nationalism go- belongs to very specific people. And I, I I usually like I'm very again, I'm kind of obsessed with categorization and labels. And I'm kind of pretty I'm pretty strict about how I label people because labels matter and words matter. And so I just want to make sure that we're agreeing on what definitions mean. So when he says Democrat, he means for the time, at the time, of the time, which is fair, but has no bearing on now. And so again, like, what does that mean? So I understand his upsetness. Like, I understand his anger. I think he's justified to feel angry at those Democrats. I'm angry at those Democrats. The Democrats of the past, super angry at them. So super valid. But present day stuff, what are we talking about here? So again, I don't think either Republican Republican or Democrat, I don't think either party is ever going to represent you as an entity, as a consciousness. You're just voting closest to and like for things you need, right? Now, somebody might say, Brittany, when you vote Democrat, you're voting anti my rights, which I hear from the religious a lot. When you vote pro-choice, you're, you're voting against the right of the baby. And I actually do agree with them that when I vote pro-choice, I am voting against the rights of the fetus. And I think that that's a fair assessment because that is a fact. I am saying that that fetus, that baby, doesn't have more rights than the right of the mother. Now, spiritually, 
right? Like not to be woo-woo here, but spiritually, I'm pretty pro-life in the sense that I don't think we should do capital punishment unless, you know, again, I don't think we should force people to die. I think if people want to volunteer, if people are on their deathbed, if people want to have a dignified death, that's different. But if we're forcing people to die, yeah, obviously that's not great, bros. War's not great and abortion isn't great. But at the same time, my ick around forcing people to die is trumped by my value of bodily autonomy. So I have to be pro-choice because I believe in bodily autonomy. I want it for myself. I want it for my baby-bearing people. I want people to have the choice over their bodies more than anyone else. Anyone else. Like I don't want anyone to have a say in what you do with your body, whether you're a man or a woman or a non-binary person. I think it's really dangerous to give the government or your mob mentality community the right over your body right? I'm pretty anti-prisons except for the worst of criminals. I think a lot of the time we think like prison is an easy solution. We think it's easy to imprison someone. We really, really don't imagine it could be us in that place. And so I think we just think like, who cares what happens to those people over there? But I can't help but imagine like, what if that was me? I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to be told I can't have an abortion and I have to die because of an ectopic pregnancy. I don't want that. One of the things I learned while living in Europe is my partner told me like abortions is a human right here. He's like the idea that you can't get an abortion is so interesting to me in America. He's like it's a human right here. And that's important. I'm in a Catholic country. And as far as I know, I can get an abortion here. So it's just one of those things, right? Depending on where you are in the world, we're defining things differently. What is freedom if I'm not free over the choices in relation to my body? If I'm not free to die how I want and live how I want, what is freedom? What are we even talking about? Um, so if you guys are just tuning in, again, we're trying to give each other tools. I'm trying to give you tools to humanize people through this new election season coming up because it is going to be ugly. And I want everyone to know that there's a lot of optimism and hope you can have around this election season. And it also will be very stressful. And it doesn't mean we have to become ugly because we're stressed, even though stress is a literal killer. I get it literally a killer. Okay, ready? Oh, I was loving the one before. So personally, I feel like there's really only one thing that white people have a true advantage over black people with, and it's that white people are less likely to be forced into a box. It happens with black people onto other black people, but it especially happens with white liberals onto black conservatives, where we are told that we are supposed to think a certain way, be a certain way, and if we're not, then we're called all these names like etc. And the worst of all is boot. Okay, first of all, Xavier is very handsome, sir. <laughs> Okay, very handsome. Second of all, everyone is pushed into a box. Ask the internet, like, what category you are, they will tell you. I think there is this misconception that it's just in politics, but it's just especially in politics, but it's in life. So again, going back to the philosophy of the consciousness, what does it mean to have knowledge of the why? You're talking about the root of you as a consciousness, the very part of you that isn't able to be identified through the politics. The politics is the cherry on top. So like the foundation of your cake can't be your political identity. That's a choice you made, which is why people put you in the box because you chose the box. But of course, the nuance is that within the box, there is caveats. There is the assumption, like I do like it, like, okay, one of the reasons I do want to make it clear to people, like, if you want to know Britney as a consciousness outside of her labels, like, no offense, you'd have to be very intimately involved in my life. You'd have to be someone who can hear me and see me. And that's not always possible, right? If you want to know um, who I am very quickly, well, I don't mind being generalized. It's like, yeah, I'm progressive. I'm queer, pansexual. Um, I believe in hard work and doing your best to be an independent person. I, you know, I, you know, I'm uh, sex positive and was polyamorous for 10 years, but now I'm monogamous. Like there's a lot of things in those labels you can assume about me that are probably more true than false, but obviously you're going to get some things wrong. Just like when you hear like, oh, you're a black conservative. It's very easy to go, okay, so this must mean this, this, and this. Like right now, no offense, and I mean this in the nicest way possible, everyone on this panel has been a caricature slash a good generalization of what I assumed everyone would be. The liberals are talking like liberals and the conservatives are talking like conservatives and everyone sounds like everyone who came before them. Yeah, everyone, like when I was growing up in politics, like I've had this exact conversation a thousand times. 
because when you fit into a box, you tend to talk like each other, express things like each other. You have similar language, which is good. It's not bad. It's good. It's like I showed it to you guys a few podcast or a few live shows ago, right? There is a test that people do. There's this guy who literally does it for progressives and then conservatives do it for themselves. You you say things in a certain way, hoping that people who are like you will be like, oh, yeah. Like when I was on the panel the other day with Erudite and everybody and the guy used spoons. I forgot his name. He was really nice. But he used the word spoons. And I was like, oh, kindred spirit. Kindred spirit. Like he he knows about chronic health issues. Right away, he used language that I use because we're in the similar bubbles where I'm like, cool, I didn't know that. That's awesome, right? So this is good, right? Like that you guys talk a certain way, but also that's why it lacks nuance because people just shortcut to how can I sum you up in a sentence? Now, obviously, like on my Discord, we try really, 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 really hard, really, really, really hard to come in good faith and to assume everyone has a little bit of a uniqueness around them. But again, it's not hard to see, even on the uniqueness of my Discord, what category we all fit into. Girls, you know who I'm talking about. You know, you know that we all get into our cliques. You know which one of us gets along better than others. Like there are some interesting clicks that happen on the Discord because as much as people want the nuance and as much as people want to be like, I don't judge and I don't have bias, girl, shut the fuck up. Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to me. Come on. We like who we like and we have tension with who we have tension with because we're not seeing each other. And maybe we can't. Maybe a conservative from the South will never be able to understand me and my weirdness. Cool. They're not obligated to. I just ask that you don't murder or deny people civil rights or access to jobs or bodily autonomy or any of those things just because you don't understand them, right? And that's usually what happens. I don't understand you, so I'm afraid of you, so I'm going to deny you access to things. I get it. It's so human. But anyways, okay, so let's keep going. Bootlicker. Because I hate when a white liberal tells me as a black man that I'm a bootlicker. Because then I ask, whose boot am I licking? Because you're telling me as a white person that me, as a black person, that I'm licking your boot because I don't think in this box that you want me to frame my mentality in? That, to me, is real racism. And that's what we need to stop allowing to happen to us because black people are so quick now. Mm, mm. Okay, two things. I am in love with my partner and the universe has blessed me and I'm so glad we met because he just made me an amazing dinner. Thank, thank you. Like, st thank you. Mm, stuffed pasta, cheese, onions. Oh, so good. I want to say this. I understand this. There is nothing worse than going through something and having a hardship and having somebody look at you and tell you like, you're this and you're, there is nothing worse than people not only not seeing you, but then trying to put you in a box that you're like, excuse me. Now, sometimes people are right and they see things about ourselves that we can't see. But often if people are too biased and everybody has biased, well, seriously, when I meet a person who's like, I don't have any biased, like go literally go watch a sunset. If you're a person on the planet, a consciousness who literally thinks for real, and it's not just a front of your ego, that you don't hold biased, go watch a sunset because that's all you're good for. Are you kidding? Are you kidding, right? We all have bias. It's such a ridiculous concept. I Just humans are so ridiculous. It hurts to be put in a box, but sometimes we fit in ones nicely, right? And that's okay. But it does annoy me as well when I have people who like try to in – um, who try to invalidate my experience. But also, sometimes I need people to inquire and be curious about my experience in case I can have a different relationship with it. Because perspective is everything. So that idea of like philosophy, right? Like the idea of what is knowledge? What is the consciousness? Like who am I in the universe? That comes down to radical honesty with the self. What trope am I? Am I the nice guy? Am I the white knight? Am I the simp? Am I the rabbit feminist? Am I the obnoxious, like, man-hating mis misandrist? Am I the misogynist? Am I, like, what, what category am I? And then being really honest about it, which can be scary because you're like, oh my gosh, I thought I could be, I thought it was so different than the way I view myself. And again, sometimes when people are viewing you, they're wrong. And sometimes they're right. And sometimes it's a mixture of both. But being invalidated does really suck. So, like, I like to validate and then tear it apart. Validate, valid. Let's make sure it it works. So usually like with my callers, 
Um, I will do this thing where I'm like, okay, valid. We love this. Now let's actually like throw it at the wall and look at it outside of ourselves because I want to make sure that we're both not being distracted by our desire to like think of it one way. So if we're talking about like, you know, is this where I want to go in my life? It's like, okay, well, hold on. What does it mean to go? What does it mean to life, right? So like, let's actually decide because maybe this is where you're supposed to go. But instead of like shooting it down right away, let's like validate it as an option. And then let's actually look at the roadmap because like maybe we're not seeing the full picture, but then maybe we are. And then it's okay to be curious and open and tear it apart because it's still going to get us back to where we thought we were in the first place, which is good because then it will reassure you that you did know yourself and that you were right the first time around. But there's nothing wrong with checking, you know? to not branch out and have new ways of thinking or to go into careers like agriculture and these other career paths that black people don't typically get into. It's not because of racism stopping them from getting in there. It's because we're told for so long that you have to follow this path and you have to think a certain way. I think America is a great place for a black person. I think I'm an American. Anything that's available to you is available to me and mine. I've personally never experienced white people having way more privileges than me. Like, I'm sure you could find. Mm. It's both. It's sometimes racism and it's sometimes a lack of desire. It's both. All things are happening at all times. So sometimes a white person will hate a black person because they're black. And sometimes they'll just hate a black person because the person who, the consciousness that is inside of a black body just is an asshole, right? But that's the problem. It's, that's why we have to know why. So when I'm in a conversation like, oh, I saw this makeup guru the other day. Oh, it was so bad. She was like Russian or something. And these Eastern European girls are always doing stuff like this. But she's very white, very white. And then all of a sudden she transformed her look and she had brown skin and a, a hair, a weave, like a, like a wig that looked black. Okay, girl. I was like, mm. and right away I was like, oh, what's this? What is this? And I showed my partner. I was like, what is this? What's going on? And right away, everyone in the comments was like, oh, mm. oh, oh. Uh. So there's sometimes makeup artists I see, like the girl who went famous for doing Kobe, where I was like, that Kobe was really good. And I'm not going to consider that like racist or blackface because that was that was like too good of an art piece. But I could see why people might be, oh, is that racist? That's a great question. And then I saw the other makeup girl and I was like, oh, this feels racist. Like this feels icky. And I think icky is a much more honest word. When things feel icky to us, we have to decide, like, is it feeling icky because of our bias or is it feeling icky because of our knowledge and because we know better? And that's the thing. When you see things and you feel icky about it, is it because our knowledge is informing us that we are accurately seeing something or because our bias is, like, building up and our prejudice is showing? You know, what are we what are we really icking about? You know what I'm saying? And that's that's where people are missing things. You know what I mean? So again, everyone has a different lived experience. Like my parents as immigrants will say like, oh, America has been great to them. They've never had problems in America, but they also purposely, and they will say like, America's not as racist as you think it is. But then my mom and dad purposely did not raise their kids knowing their languages because they didn't want us to have an accent because they knew it would be harder for us. Do you hear me? My parents knew as conservatives that if they taught us their own languages, the languages I heard my whole life growing up, the language my parents still speak, my relatives speak to this day, if I grew up hearing the language and speaking it, I would have an accent. And that accent would deter me, would be the reason people treated me like less than, because that's how they were treated when they immigrated here. But that's not racism, and that's definitely not an issue with America. That's something different. Like they can't put it together. They know it's there. That was their reasoning for not teaching us the language. But they can't then connect it to America's racism. They can't. They whoop, whoop, whoop. And that's why politics gets so ugly this time of year. Or, you know, it just gets so ugly because you're looking, you're sitting across from someone you love so much and they love you so much. And they'll say something that's so obvious. You're like, yes. Yes, you see it. You see that there's a disadvantage to being an immigrant or a person of color. You see it. And then they're like, but that's not it. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> they were so close. How can they say the answer out loud and then not connect it? It's like, oh, you just said it. Oh, and then the, it's, oh, the conclusion ends up being wrong. And so the radical acceptance comes from me and my ability to see like humans are going to human. And people are going to sit there and say the answer out loud and still have the wrong conclusion. They're going to say the answer 
and still pick the wrong conclusion. And I get to share a planet with those people. And what an honor. <laughs> what an honor <laughs> to learn patience this way. It's a conundrum, people. It's a conundrum. You know? Mm. Okay. Certain institutions where black people are treated differently. But in general, I don't think that I've missed out on anything because of being black. And if anything, it's going to be more of a voice because people will want to hear what I say now because I'm black. <laughs> so if anything, it, I have more of a platform now just on the basis of being a black conservative and saying what's not popular than I would if I was just a white person who was also conservative. No, cringe. So she just said, I'm a token black person. That's my advantage. You're OK. Yes. So if you're playing the game, and you're a minority in conservatism, like I was Middle Eastern and a lesbian, like, or, you know, I'm queer, pansexual now, but at the time, they wanted to brand me that way. That's how talk radio was going to, like, brand us. Like, when we were young and conservative and thinking about doing talk radio, they wanted to brand me as the Assyrian, like, lesbian, the Middle Eastern lesbian. And, like, that's how I branded myself for a long time because I thought it was really sticky. Like, oh, I'm a conservative lesbian, like, a Syrian. Like, ooh, you know, it looks good. Like I'm an I'm an, I come from an immigrant background, and this is but you become like the token. That's why you get the advantage, but you also have to play the game like Candace Owens and Patrick Bet David and like all these people is like yeah you can be the minority token. Because politics is about a game. The left will do it to you too. Progressives will do it to you too. Progressives are in politics, so they are also playing a game, and they're also playing a branding game. So again. If you identify yourself only through politics, then you are nothing but a token or nothing but a stereotype or nothing but a box. And you will, for a time, feel more seen by the opposite group you hang out with until that group also burns the bridge with you because you've changed. Because that's, again, I'm anecdotal, but this is what happened to me, right? I went from bubble to bubble to bubble thinking like, do you guys see me? Do you guys have the answers? Are you guys cool? And everyone invited me. Everyone loves me everywhere I go until... I say something they don't like. Then it's like, who is this girl? Why isn't she toting the line? Why isn't she doing it our way? Right? Why isn't Brittany following the rules? Why isn't she, why doesn't she want to be a part of our group? And I'm like, y'all's group is too strict on the rules. But then I have even individual people do that to you. Your parents do that to you. Your boss does that to you. And so you've got to figure out what game you're playing. I, as a consciousness, know that I am much more nuanced, but I also know that if I'm in a specific bubble, like if I'm in the politics bubble, I'm anti-Republican. If I'm outside the politics bubble, I'm anti-conservative values that coincide with being anti-LGBT and anti-bodily autonomy. And if I'm outside of that bubble, then I'm anti-people who kill you who hurt you, who rape you, who do X, Y, and Z. Now I'm outside the bubble of individual does X and that's what I'm anti. So again, it's about having that understanding of in which way am I observing myself and in which way am I allowing myself to be seen? If I was in politics, I was told literally, have your stick out front, your brand, but then behind closed doors, do whatever you want. Which is why I know some, some of those radio hosts that y'all love so much, have gay friends, throwing parties, telling lies, having sex with prostitutes, snorting cocaine off hookers. Anyways, well, in public, they're a family man. Okay. Okay. I agree. I agree with the Supreme Court's decision to end affirmative action. The Supreme Court's decision to end affirmative action. Okay. This volume just got so low when they read that question, right? So the question is, I agree with the Supreme Court's decision to end affirmative action. I think – I'm not going to start. Someone else can start. Sorry. I think, I think affirmative action has served its purpose. I think that it was necessary for a particular time. And I think that every black person knows how to get into college. Every black – I mean, you can pull out the, the names, the Oprah, the oh, President Obama. You can pull out the, – the head of Time Warner was black man. The Forbes was black man. We know what to do now. We don't need affirmative action anymore. And to me, affirmative action is offensive sometimes, especially nowadays, because um, I have six children and uh, two boys, four girls. And uh, <clears throat> all of them went to Harvard and Columbia and this one and that one. And it, would, it breaks my heart to think that they uh, accomplished their, that goal of getting to, into these institutions just be Damn. Can I say something, though? They're really good at playing the college game. 
they didn't just get there. They had to play the game to get into college. Like college is a game I don't really understand. Um, I didn't come from like a pro college background unless you're going to like a religious college. And college is a game my friends played around me, but it's a very hard game. I feel intimidated by the game of college, going to the right college, finding out the right people to be networking with, getting the right degrees, having the label, like making sure you're in the right bubble of college. Like who's your college? Where'd you graduate from? Like that's a networking game, right? Like college is a game. You can't just get into college, right? You have to do things. There are steps to get into college. I honestly am so ignorant to those things. Like I'm so... It would be so intimidating for me to go back to school if I ever did, but it is one of those things, right? Mm. Do you, sorry, I saw a comment that says, do you think there are any prerequisites to loving yourself? Depends on what you mean, right? What are you imagining? I think awareness is needed, right? You need to be aware that you have the free will to change perspective. I don't think a lot of people believe they can change. And so you could argue that that's one of them, right? So these people, right, like great point from this mom to say like, hey, my kids knew how to play a game, but I wish she knew it was a game. I wish she knew like, oh, yeah, like your kids did something that is kind of amazing because it's really hard to do that. Your kids are amazing. Your kids are, might I say, the exception because of the color of their skin. I can definitely say that it creates a lot of tension when you have affirmative action. I remember my first week at the University of Illinois, I was sitting with some classmates and a white student turned to me and jokingly like, hey, Xavier, like, did you just attach a smiley face when you applied for this college? And I started asking what he meant. And he said to me that he was like, you're black. I'm assuming you had decent grades. You could have just attached a smiley face and you would have gotten into the university. So I was livid by that. And I went off and started naming all my accomplishments. And I felt so confident only for about an hour. Because then an hour later, I started saying to myself like, wow, like, did I actually earn my way in here? I started to have this mm -hmm. insecurity. And I started wondering to myself, did I earn this position myself or did my ancestors suffering earn this for me? And too, I've seen it in the sense of like affirmative action taking away from other people who are minorities. Like I had a friend who was Asian and he in high school and he really wanted to go to MIT. That was his dream school. He interned there. He was super like prepared to go there and he didn't get in. And you can only assume that it was because of affirmative action because they have such a large Asian population that they want to admit other people. Um, yeah, I was going to actually argue that it's more racist nowadays because it excludes so many Asian Americans from getting into universities right. who do deserve a spot and they can't get in because of affirmative, affirmative action, which again, like you were saying, was necessary at the time, yeah. but now it's like Forgot anybody, that. if you have the skills to do it and you're in America, you can, yeah. you can get in. I don't think affirmative action is the worst thing considering all the different types or aspects of a background you might take into account when somebody's getting into college, whether they were in certain clubs, you know, Boy Scouts, what type of classes they took that might not be available to everybody. I don't think that factoring in the affirmative action is necessarily a bad thing, but I feel like because of everything you guys have said, the optics behind it are so horrible today that even if it is slightly beneficial in the long run for certain people, I think we can probably refocus most of that into figuring out like the class that people come from, the neighborhoods, the backgrounds or whatever, without it having to necessarily target race. The only thing that I kind of wonder now that it's gone is instead of a black person being in school thinking like, man, am I here because I'm an affirmative action pick, is it going to be a kid that is poor or a kid that's from a different zip code? I think we should do away with all of it. It's just like submit an application, no demographics. Why do they ask your sexuality? Like, why do they ask all that stuff? Mm. <laughs> oh my God, I just joked on myself. Okay, <clears throat> that was interesting, right? They basically agreed. Um, and I think that's good that they're finding commonality. I'm kind of indifferent to it, honestly. Like things work, they don't work. They work for some people. They're not going to work for everybody. I'm not sure that it's the most efficient thing in the world, but I'm not sure that it wasn't efficient in some ways. I'm actually, I'm pretty indifferent to affirmative action myself. Like if it works, use it. If it doesn't work, get rid of it. But then we have to debate on what it mean, what it means for something to work. You know what I mean? Um, oh, good comment says, if you know you worked hard, why question it? I think that's the problem is that working hard is subjective. What does it mean to work hard? Lots of people work for many hours a day and aren't working hard. They're just working in a way that feels hard but isn't. And then there's like working efficiently. And then there's like working to earn a place at a, pl at a certain level. I know um, I have friends in like certain industries where they're white and typical looking and they often feel like people of color do get jobs over them and that sucks to them and they hate it. But the dilemma, once again, is that no matter who you are, someone is getting something because of a reason that is sort of unjustified, whether it's their Nepo babies or whether they know somebody at the college. And honestly, there are perks. I'm really grateful when I have connections because life is pretty hard and connections make it easier. I also know that it's unfair that people who don't have connections don't get to benefit in those ways and they, that's their struggle. But I think no matter who you are and where you're at, because it's humans judging it, 
because it's people picking, we're always picking because of our bias. Like, I don't know why people think they don't have bias. I don't think there's any way to do anything truly fairly because what does it mean to do it fairly? Like, do we, if there was truly a fair system, would you would think we would have implemented it. But I think because of how humans operate, I don't think humans themselves are fair. We're not fair to ourselves with how critical we are. We're not fair to our people around us. We're not fair in how we assess things because we're often in our emotions. Like we're not fair because we're not being reasonable or logical. We're not always fair. And so I think it's weird that we don't understand that I think life is unfair. You know what I mean? But that's why I want to teach you how to play the game of the unfair life. Life is unfair. The fact that you have to exist and then pay taxes is unfair. And in some ways, maybe it's fair that we all have to pay taxes. Or maybe we could change it so it was more fair. But what does it mean to be fair? You know what I mean? You sound Republican. Well, that's the thing. Not everything a Republican says is bad. Right? I think the core of Republican identity now is more bad than good, but there are good elements to being a conservative and a Republican. And that's the part I want to humanize this election season because, again, it's going to be very easy to be very upset with your liberal or your conservative um, parents and your like liberal kids, right? Let's say that's the demographic. That's the bubble. It's going to be very easy to demonize everybody. But I want you to see why they got to those conclusions and why it worked for them. You can't tell an immigrant who became a conservative, who the Republican Party, they vote for this Republican Party. You can't tell them after they've been successful and their business boomed and everything worked under Trump that like Trump is the worst thing ever because their lived experience is telling them the opposite. And in the same front, I don't think these conservatives have the right to look at the way that progressives were hit or some progressive gay trans teen out there was implemented, like was impacted by Trump's election. I don't think you can say that like there's no way that happened because I had such a good time. It's like COVID. There was a battle. I think even I felt it or was tempted to feel it a lot where it was like who had a better time during COVID? Look, COVID was different for everybody. Everyone had different a different time during those three years. It was harder for some and easier for others. But you're not a better person because you had a better time of it. You're not a worse person if you had a worse time of it. You were just having the relationship you had with it. It was what it was. Now, could you implement tools to have a better time when things get rougher? Yeah, totally. But you might not be ready for those tools, right? You might not be ready to have a good time when things go very bad. You might only be ready, because that's your time of suffering, to maybe learn the tools. Maybe if you went through the pandemic and you actually learned, hey, I wanted, I wanted this to be better the next time around. So you start to gather tools. Maybe you never thought to yourself, like, I should prepare for a pandemic, you know, and then you get those TikToks of people saying like, yes, shut down. I want to be alone again. There are people who are so excited for shutdowns because that means they, ca they can be home again because they don't like people. And there's a part of me that relates to that. And then there's a part of me that really hated shutdowns because like, I'm going to see my family, bros. Nobody tells me when to see my family, right? And if my family wants to take the risk, and they did, half my family did not get the shot. And they're like, not doing the whole thing. You know, I don't want to say certain words, YouTube censor stuff, but like, they are very conservative, right? Like I said, my parents still don't know I'm boosted and I got the shot. <laughs> and I got mine late and I do regret that. So you guys know, at first I was hesitant to get the shot. And I regret not getting it sooner because when I got COVID, it really bothered. I think I'm I'm pretty sure my partner and I are pretty sure I'm still suffering from long term COVID because I I'm still having trouble breathing. I'm still having problems with stuff. And it sucks. I think if I got the shot earlier, I wouldn't have been so bad because my friends who got it earlier and then got sick are better off. So I, I, I do wish I got mine before. But some people got the shot and had such a bad reaction to it. They feel like their world ended because of it. And who am I to discount that? Some people had bad reactions to the shot. So I'm not here to discount that reality because like it happened to them. You know what I mean? Everyone's having a different relationship with reality. And I just want to validate the people who are having a real experience and then maybe give people who are having a misperception of their experience a different tool to see their situation differently. You know what I mean? Agree on fairness, although I believe fairness has a bit to do with consent. If everyone in a group consents that someone gets an extra leg up, that would be fair, I think, for sure. And I think if we were being honest with ourselves, in our own communities, we often do allow people a leg up when we feel like, yeah, of course, I'm not going to ask my, my, if my, like, if I have a friend in a wheelchair, I'm not going to ask them to carry the groceries up the staircase. Like, that would be weird. 
But then some people might say like, oh, they're always getting out of chores because they're in a wheelchair. It's like, bro, how jealous of a person are you? Like, would you prefer not to have legs so you can like not help? Like, I don't understand people. People all have disadvantages. And we just, I think jealousy and wanting what other people have is like the biggest issue, right? I don't want what you have. I want what's accessible to me to be more options than less options. I don't want your life. I don't want anything about you. I don't want your boyfriends. I don't want your money. I don't want your Bugattis. I want my life. I just want the option to build it. And I think that's what's always missing in these conversations. Comments say, I hated the pandemic, the tension, um, the way people were at each other's throats really got me. It was violent over toilet paper. It was a true display of human beings at some of their lowest but highest points. I thought the way people came together in hospitals and the way people came together on social media and the way people came together in communities was really beautiful. But man, it showed an ugly side of people for sure. For sure. Which is why, again, the question of like, who is my community is really important. Because when stuff hits the fan, who is my community and who has my back, right? Many people have suffered from long-term influenza too. We just didn't bother to notice. Interesting. The reality is that there is no conservatives or progressives in the historical sense anymore. There are only conservative neoliberals and progressive neoliberals both share the same ideology. Mm. Sometimes, right? So, for sure. There are some people who fit into that category. Um, for me to love myself, I feel like I would need to change the perception I have that makes me hate. That's a good, that's a great place to start. Yeah. Is it even possible to end racism? Yes. Stop having babies and human beings should go extinct. If you want all suffering to end, stop having babies. If you want racism to end, stop having babies. If you want sexism to end, stop having babies. If you want um, homelessness to end, stop having babies. Should I go on? Stop having babies. Or keep having babies and enjoy the chaos of living amongst millions of other people. Honestly, I'm pro-chaos. Keep having babies. Enjoy the chaos. If the, as long as you have babies, right? That's why when people like observe the levels with me, and again, I say this a thousand times, if the whole world was fives, we'd still fight. Fives don't get along just because they're, fives aren't even ethical just because they're fives. This, this illusion people have over what a five is on my scale is so silly. Like, where did I say that fives were the most ethical? Where did I say that? I even said, I think they'd be less violent, but fives would still make different decisions. So I, I see people in media, like I've seen people that I'm like, I'm pretty sure they're a five, but they're so unethical. And like, that's the thing. A five is just knowing. It's a knowing a very specific thing about your own existence. And it's really how much you don't know and how much, you know, you're here for like a moment, guys. And then you die. No one's going to remember you. And with that knowledge comes a lot of power about, oh, if no one's going to remember who I am in history and no one really, nothing really matters, like how much can I get away with? Hopefully. You aim for joy and peace and love and kindness, but that might not be what they do. So again, even if you had a world of fives, all these people who knew and were chill to some extent, they would still have biases and they would still have prejudice and they would still have babies and those babies would go through the same stages of the levels and they would have to figure out who they are and those babies would probably end up being racist or prejudiced or hate people. Like I don't understand why people keep forgetting the reason bad things exist is because humans exist. And so again, humans gonna human is a reassurance to you that yeah, like you're seeing something a human being is doing and you have the right to be horrified, but it can't destroy you. You cannot let the horrible things people do destroy you because your humanity still matters. So when you're looking at politics and you're at dinner with your family this year and they're talking about taking away your civil rights, remember that no matter how horrible they seem, one, they're probably doing it because they think it's good, which is the irony of it all. And two, you have to ask yourself, am I doing the same thing in turn to check yourself? And three, remember that the whole world could blow up around you and you still are responsible for your joy. It's why it's commendable to watch people go through so much suffering and still come out the other side optimistic or wonderful. That is very hard to do. That is amazing. And I think it, we could all use a little bit more of that while still making it a point to stand up for our rights. Just because people are willing to forgive you does not mean you're a good person. Just because someone forgives you for the bad you did does not mean you still have, you don't have to work on yourself. 
And I think a lot of time people forgive people and the people who are forgiven go, ah, I was forgiven, so I'm good. And I'm like, no, no, no. Just because they forgave you does not mean you don't still have to work on yourself, right? Brittany's antinatalist clip, let's go. I'm not, I like have your babies. I don't care. I just think it's very irresponsible to have a baby and expect that baby to like save everybody from racism. Oh, that's my animal instinct. I have to care somewhat if I'm human. I mean, we all do, right? That's why the idea of like, I'm an empath. Everyone's an empath. That's pretty normal. Everyone has that. And if they don't, that's the anomaly. That's why it's interesting. Uh, Brittany, I love this background much more. Uh, much more. There's more light. Yay. And then, you know, I'm thinking about putting a plant back there. Maybe I'm not sure. This is one part of my office. I have an office now. guys. I have an office. And what did I do to get that office? I slaved away my whole life until I was 34 years old and finally was av available to, uh, uh, I finally had the ability to pay for an apartment that had an extra bedroom. Never in my life, never in my career, never until 34 years old could I afford to have an extra bedroom in an apartment. That's amazing. And I spent my whole life working to this point where I'm like, I just want an office. I just want an office. I just want to stop filming YouTube videos in my bedroom. <laughs> Please. And I worked. And I'm going to work. That's why, girls, I'm keeping it up. We are streaming. We are hustling. We are working. We are here to maintain the goal by playing the YouTube game, which I love. I'm honored to do it. I'm honored to be here with you guys. You guys make my life so, so wonderful. You guys really contribute to the way that I think and the tools that I can gain from you. And I really appreciate that, which is why I'm trying to give it to you because I get it how stressful it's going to be this year. But like I, I was patient for this goal. It wasn't a goal I assumed I would have at 25. No, that's a lie. I did assume I would have it at 25. I thought I'd be a millionaire by 25. Obviously not true. I am definitely in debt. <laughs> I am in debt, okay, but like that's the reality of my life is like I, you know, it's like, okay, no, not a millionaire, but I might be one day, probably by 40, maybe 50, maybe 60, maybe never. It doesn't matter. The game is fun. The journey is fun. As long as I have enough money to get out of debt, to save some money, to have some stability, like I'm good to go. I'm good to go. Like what else do you need in life, right? As long as I can do my basics and I can have a joyful life, like what does it mean to have money? It means playing the right kind of game in conjunction with your spoons and your joy. So again, I'm a little weird. Working is better for me than not working. So I'm, I have a little bit of an advantage in that way, which is why the game I chose is the working game. That's why I'm not the stay-at-home wife. My husband is. <laughs> uh. Uh, so if affirmative action accomplished its purpose, why do we still see the disparities that we do in the professional workplace? If you average white wealth and compare it to black wealth totals, white people as a whole have about 50 times greater wealth than black people as a whole uh, per capita. So I just don't understand why you think affirmative action has accomplished its purpose. I don't see curious. that. Um, why do you assume that just because there is a disparity means it's because of a racial issue? What else would it be from? I mean, no. upbringing, economic abilities, desire skills. to go, desire to. I mean, so it does fault. play a lot. If you grow up in a neighborhood that experiences a lot of trauma, you're not as likely to do as well in school, which means. You're why did they grow up in a neighborhood that experiences a lot of trauma? I mean, lots of people do. Yes, but why know. specifically do more black people? Uh, Government assistance programs. Government assistance programs like yeah. what? Try redlining. I mean, you can go into that if you'd like to, but let's take a look relevant. at uh, the Great Societies Act, which was created to kick black fathers out of the home and get black mothers on welfare assistance. These things aren't beneficial for economics. These things aren't beneficial for actually paving a way for success for black children and black families. I mean, taking, you know, reducing a two-family household to a one-family household isn't going to make them the richest man in the world. It isn't even going to get them out of high school. Nonetheless, you mean the ability parent. to even get to college. You mean yeah, two-parent? The, the child, yes, but a two-parent household yeah. in comparison to a one-parent household, that child is not going to be nearly as successful. That child is more disposed to being sent into prison by doing crimes or not doing very well in school. So how are they even supposed to get that, you know, that wealth disparity shrunk if they aren't even able to get out of the community that is causing these problems for them? Something I think that this conversation illustrates is that like affirmative action is literally the very end of the line of a lot of different parts of a person's life. And by that point, trying to rectify all of the inequities that have existed to try to remedy any of that at the very end with affirmative action, it might just be too broad a brush. And maybe we'd be better served focusing on the earlier issues than trying to throw a kid who maybe, you know, can barely read at a sixth grade level into a college to hope that that's the thing that fixes the problem at the end of the line. I think affirmative action wasn't really supposed to like send kids to Harvard that weren't prepared to go to Harvard. I think that's quite a myth, in fact. I think those that have the qualities to get to Harvard were before affirmative action were just completely overlooked. You know, uh, Clarence Thomas is like the perfect example, um, you know, regardless of what you uh, think about him. 
um, he was able to get to Harvard because of affirmative action, because, you know, it was it focused on um, finding people that were, you know, again, like just overlooked. But, affirmative, but things in, ended up changing. It, it more mm. Again, I think. <laughs> You're a true leftist having your boyfriend at home. I mean, you know, she likes it. I will say I I again, when I'm telling you to play the game to the best of your ability, that means you can't fall into these tropes, like these characterizations of looking at the problem. As the individual, you should look at affirmative action and say to yourself, like, okay, does this benefit me? And if it does, take advantage of it, girl. You're living one life and then you're going to die. And right now, the system doesn't care about you as a consciousness. So if you're in the system and you're playing the system's games, use that system. It isn't about fairness. Life is unfair. You want to use tax loopholes? Do it. You want to do this? Use it. If it's if it works and it's legal and you're not going to go to prison, like have some fun. And at the same time, if you built a community up from scratch, would this be the community you would build? And that's the hard part. I don't think any of us would build a community from scratch in our heads that would unfairly put people in places they didn't deserve to be. I think that in life, it just is unfair. So people are in places they shouldn't be. From nepotism to just like good networking to the good intentions of people who want to give you a handout. Like I said, it's really nice having connections. It's very nice. And at the same time, I don't want to have to build a world where you need to use those connections, but I live in a world where you do. And so I think it is a little silly for us to look at life and not take advantage of opportunities. And at the same time, I can understand if you can't take advantage because it doesn't coincide with your values, right? I understand that. But that's the that's the problem is, again, when I ask myself, okay, where are my values Am I surviving or am I living? If I'm living, I'm playing a different game. If I'm surviving, I'm playing a different game, right? In survival situations, like girls, connections, uh, resources, uh, asking friends and family for help. Barbara uh, Corcoran from Shark Tank, there's a TikTok of her. Oh, it makes me, I love Barbara. And she was like, hey, I tell kids all the time, hit your parents up for money. You want to buy a house? Tell your parents to buy the house for you. And I'm like, what kind of parents do you have, girl? And I realized like, yeah, all of Gen Z that owns houses, they had parents who helped them pay for that house, a lot of them, right? That's why it's really interesting versus like millennials. Like, I don't know what baby boomer parents you had, but I didn't have no parents who had money to buy their kids homes. Like that is not the kind of parents I have. I have parents that are open to maybe helping us with a down payment if we follow the rules of their bubble. Like my mom has often said like, oh, Betsy, I'll, I'll, maybe I should help you buy a house. And I'm like, no, thank you. And because like if my mom buys a house, there's strings attached. She won't She won't want me to stream. She won't want me to, I can't do OF. Like she'll have contingencies. I don't go into business with family or friends. Uh-uh. I've seen how that ends. Uh-uh. I'm going to buy my house by myself. Thank you. I'm going to do it with me and my person, okay? Because like, mm -mm, mm -mm, I'm going to do the Dave Ramsey thing. Don't take money from relatives. Don't do it. Some people can do it because they have a much better relationship and they see eye to eye with their family. Like I got a friend, same thing. Her parents are like, we'll help you with a house, dude. We'll buy you a, buy you a house. Um, and I was like, do it, girl. Do it. Because they're on the same page, like in terms of politics and ethics. Her parents aren't going to hold it over her head. So I'm like, do it, girl. Take advantage. What? Have your parents buy you a house. Make some money. Become a landlord. Do it. Like, do it. You know what I mean? Because again, we're talking about the fact that like if you're an artist or you're an independent contractor or if you, you know, want to even survive through the basics, whether you're a college grad or not, you have to have resources. And resources like a house help. You know what I mean? So again, when we're playing a game, it depends on our goal. If my goal was just to buy a house, then yeah, I would maybe suck it up and have my mom help me and then pay her back and call it good. But like I could be a renter. I make a great renter. Why wouldn't I just rent so I could have my freedom? I don't live at home with my parents because as much as I love them, it drives me crazy. Some of my siblings, even though they're my parents' religion and politics drives them crazy, they're fine living at home and paying rent to my parents because it's way cheaper in Cali, let me tell you. So 
Everyone has different abilities to play different games. Like some of my siblings are able to save for their homes because they can live at home and pay cheaper rent. I think my parents charge them $600 a room versus $1,800 for a one-bedroom apartment in their area, right? So my siblings are kind of saving a lot of money. Now, assuming they play the game right and actually save their money, if they spend that money, well, then it doesn't matter that my parents are letting them live at home. There's no there's no perk to that because they're still not even utilizing it for the benefit of buying the home. So again, well, we're all having very different relationships with whatever game we're playing, right? So again, I don't care if it for, that's why when I think Destiny actually asked me this question when we collabed one time where he's like, he's like, you don't care about like capitalism or socialism or anything. I don't care. Just tell me what the game is and I'll be good at it. Because again, I don't think any of these things are fair. It doesn't matter which system you have. And I don't think people are introspective enough to be fair. And I don't think it matters because I'm going to die in like uh, 50 years before y'all figure it out anyway. So like, let's just go. Tell me what the rules are so I know which rules to break. That's how I feel about life. You know what I mean? Morphed into something else. So what started out as a good program of, of, of giving all black people or people um, with a lesser chance or lesser opportunity, it started out as that. And then it morphed it. And I'm not sure who morphed it, but it morphed into, OK, so now we have that one black, one Hispanic, one this, one that. That's and, not how that works. And, but hey, talk to the corporations, talk to the people who hire, talk to the board members who say we need to have a woman on the board. We need to have a black on the board. We need to have a, a Latina, a Latinx or whatever on, on the board. So so it morphed from from helping us into now tokenization. Yes. So you have to have one of this, one of that. And well, when you start with a country where people only hire you if you're white, that's necessary. And I know that you said that it started good and then ended whatever. And I don't think that affirmative action was perfect by any measure. But we still see really, really bad inequality. So if you're going to get rid of affirmative action, what's the replacement? The meritocracy. Is people need to There's no meritocracy yes, in this country. Is. Look at Elon Musk. He's destroying Twitter. There's no meritocracy. That's ridiculous. Well, first thing I want to bounce back to is it's not a myth that there are like minorities that are being put into colleges that they're not ready for. If you look at a lot of these top universities, including Harvard, Yale, et cetera, you're going to see a lot of minorities on academic probation because they are being placed in universities that they are not ready for. They are not cut out for that just yet. And it even just makes sense if you look at how much they have to achieve in order to get there. Asian students on average have to score 450 points higher than a black student in order to get in the same university. So if you think of the universities that have courses, et cetera, that, gr that grade on a curve, you can only have so many people with an A, so many people with a B, et cetera. So that means that the bottom percentile is going to fail. Who is most likely, just based on logic, going to be the ones failing? It's going to be the people who didn't have the credentials to get there in the first place. And then I have to bounce back to- I wanna, I wanna, get, I wanna get you on that point because I would posit that the people who are least likely to have good outcomes in an academic setting are those who have to work two jobs, are those who have to drive there from home because they can't afford a dorm, are those who have to go into crippling financial debt. These are the, and, and have other stresses in their life. They can't afford a doctor, they can't afford a dentist, they can't afford anything. I have to do so that too, though. Those are the Bro, let me just tell you, um, I'm getting my teeth done because I have cavities and totally bummed, but like it is what it is, right? So I'm like, okay. I went to my U.S. dentist and they wanted like $3,000. And I was like, girl, um, I'm going to get done in Croatia. I went to my dentist, got the dental work done, got an assessment. I was like, cool, I'll do it in Croatia. It's going to be like half the price. Um, It's just insane. Like I... I don't mind paying the dentist. Like if I lived in Arizona still, I would have paid him. I understand I'm feeding his family. I understand this is what he charges. But $3,000 in cash, I wasn't going to pay on a credit card. $3,000. $3,000. I just, you know what I mean? $3,000. How are you supposed to spend $3,000 on one appointment for your teeth when you're making, what, like 25 k a year? I'm not making 25 k Other people. Like, what are those families supposed to do when you have kids? With all the sugars and foods everyone eating, like, I assume all your kids got cavities. I hadn't been to a dentist in literally so many years. It's kind of horrible. I'm such a child, but... I'm like, okay, teeth cleaning, went in for my teeth cleaning. I love getting my teeth cleaned at the dentist. It's so nice. But then they find things and they, $3,000. Or my medical bills, like, again, Europe can do it. It's a much smaller demographic. Croatia's 4 million people. It's the size of Phoenix. Of course, they have the infrastructure to sort of support their people, right? But like, you know what I mean? Does the price of flying to Croatia cancel out the savings? No, because I live here now. 
And like even my rent is less. My rent for a three bedroom, three toilet, two bath, uh, ocean view apartment and like, you know, high up on like the eighth, ninth, tenth floor um, is less than I was paying in Arizona for a three bedroom, three bath townhome two-story in a forest which was gorgeous by the way totally gorgeous I lived in a beautiful place in Arizona it was so beautiful but I was paying more for that place than this place and that's crazy to me so I'm like it's not a like it's a few hundred dollars of savings well no that's a lie it's a few hundred dollars on the rent of savings but utilities it's like another couple hundred dollars so now that I live here I'm gonna save a lot more but on healthcare especially because one of the debt I have is like I have healthcare debt I still have debt from healthcare problems, like going to the hospital and stuff during um, COVID. Um, I still have debt I have to pay off here and there. Then I'm like, oh, I went to the hospital then. I didn't have the – at the time, I was making far less money. I think when I went to the hospital during COVID, I think I was only making like 30 k a year. And so it was like a three $3,000 bill or something. So that that went on, you know, collections. <laughs> And then um, years and years ago, I got like a $10,000 bill. Um, that one's good. But even those moments, I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, what am I supposed to do with this bill? And I had insurance. So what am I supposed to do? The reason I stopped getting health insurance in America was because I was paying like $300 a month and it didn't even cover any of my bills. And I was like, what was the point of this? And now, you know, it's different. You know, I have different health insurance now from America that I had to get to move here. It was a whole thing. So I have health insurance. But it is, you know, it's just a whole thing. What I'm trying to say is that I think people don't realize, like when you actually start taking care of your body, when you actually do go to the doctor and you start doing health checkups and you figure out, oh, you have an illness that isn't diagnosed. How do I get it diagnosed? And you spend like 16K trying to go to health specialists and doctors and get it diagnosed. Who's going to be able to do that? Most people just live with their illnesses and then die young. It's a lot of money to take care of yourself in America. And I don't think it should be. But I think the fact that we keep ignoring that it is, that's going to be a problem. And I think it already started being a problem. People. That's not just black people. It's not just... But it's if overwhelmingly... Big numbers, there are more white people in poverty than black people. <laughs> if you look at the wrong numbers, but if you actually know, understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. No, no the issue is poverty wrong. in general, though. I don't think it's like who's in poverty. It's like poverty sucks. It's, maybe we should make college free. It. And maybe we want to have, have for actually wouldn't be that necessary. It'll get program, even more ghetto. <laughs> if you have a program that says you are under, if you are under a certain income level, this is how we'll help you. That will overwhelmingly help black people at a far greater percentage than it will help white people. Trump supports black lives. When they say Trump supports black lives, are they saying Trump the politician supports black lives or Trump the individual American supports black lives? I'm assuming they mean Trump the president. And then do they mean Trump the president or do they mean Trump the, the... It's a weird question. I don't think this question is a good question. It doesn't make any sense, right? Like this question makes no sense to me. Like if, how, hmm. I wouldn't even know how to answer this question. Trump supports black lives. Trump supports anything that supports Trump. So maybe, <laughs> like maybe, I don't know what this question means. I think that President Trump supports all lives. I think that he looks at all American citizens as equal. I don't see him doing anything that would make you feel like he does not support black lives. Um, that's, of course, going to lead into the conversation of Black Lives Matter, which was a movement and an organization with so much corruption. Donald Trump not supporting that organization doesn't mean that he doesn't support black lives. It just means that he doesn't support the fraudulent organization that's stealing so much money from so many people to do absolutely nothing with it, nor does he support a destructive movement that is destroying cities, communities, lives, etc. So I don't see why. Mm. Okay, hold on. Mm. If you didn't support Black Lives Matter as a concept before we knew about the corruption, I think that's suspicious, but not really because I think people are hesitant to, to invest in anything they don't understand. I think if you're conservative who in reaction to Black Lives Matter before we knew about the corruption decided to be anti-Black Lives Matter and put like police stickers on your car, I just think you, you don't care about Black people. I think you care about black people who agree with you, 
and only those people, but you don't actually care about black history or black struggle, which to be fair, nobody usually cares about anybody. So you're not that different than everybody else. Like you might not care about black struggle because like black struggle doesn't really care about you either, bro. So like fair, but I don't think, um, I, I think there was a time and we need to acknowledge it. And I've, look, I've, I'm biased. I've marched with BLM. I've cleaned up streets with BLM. I, uh, I feel like I did a lot of community efforts or enough community efforts with BLM at the time. And I really think the people who came together under that idea were really good people. I just think the corruption did get in the way eventually, which it does with all people, which is why this idea of being so strongly Democrat or Republican is ignoring the fact that corruption is everywhere. I think writing and dying on a political label is the mistake we're making. So again, when you're a consciousness floating through the universe and you're an individual person, do you really want to constrain your identity down to a bubble of politics? What is the solution? What's the goal? I'm not sure we're agreeing on what the goal is, so there is no solution. The only solution I can give you, because I don't do generalizations like this, I don't think you can generally help the world. I think you can only individually help the world. I'm pretty pretty radical about that. I feel like the only thing I can do is help individuals. I don't have the tools to help people because people are nobody. Nobody is people, which is why it's hard to support black lives because who are black lives? It's hard to support white people. Who are white people? It's hard to support the gays. Who are the gays? It's the version of that thing in your head. And not everybody has a good experience of that thing. Right? So again, like when people are like, we should fight for men. Like who are men? Which ones? Which men? We should fight for women. Which, which women? I don't know how to do this. Like who am I fighting for? But at the same time, I remember choosing to march with the tea parties, choosing to march with BLM. I wanted to help people in groups. I just don't think that that's the right path. I just think it feels really good. And so it, it does matter. Like protests do help. Things help, but they're always like Band-Aid solutions, which is, I totally get it. So valid. Band-Aid solutions, cope is real. And it's not always hopeless, but I do think like the greatest change that happens in the world is acknowledging our differences and how we're not supposed to force each other to be like us. It's not how we're the same. It's helpful to know how we're the same, but I think it's more important to know how we're different and how we can still make peace with that difference. I think that's what's important. How am I different from you and how do I still maintain my joy and how do I still maintain humanizing you and you humanizing me? How do we still look at each other like valuable people even though we're different. Because it's easy to get along with someone who's similar to you until they're different. And then you're like, mm, I don't know if you're invited to the barbecue anymore. You know what I mean? Why someone would think that President Trump doesn't support black lives. I've heard him say uh, he knows all the best black people. He has all the best black friends. I, I do support black people all the time. Uh, so sorry, that was a very bad impression. But um, I, I, don't think that, I don't think Donald Trump wants bad things to happen to black people. So in that respect, I think he does support black lives. But the other side of that is he's not really doing anything. He didn't do anything as president, certainly, to uplift black people. The economy affects black people. Yeah, I, I certainly disagree with that point. One of the biggest things I what supported did he do for the personally. Well, yeah, we, we don't, we'll, get, we'll get into that one later. One of the biggest things he did is he, he secured permanent funding for HBCUs, one of the largest increases we ever saw for HBCUs, personally done by his administration, among many other things. The First Step Act, which, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether it was really the best thing to do, but that was definitely a, a, a kiss of love to, black, to the black race. Uh, freeing Alice Johnson for menial drug crimes she committed in the past that had her locked up. She did not get to see her family for years. Yeah, but that's not like, okay, I did say I agree, but I agree in the sense that Donald Trump doesn't literally want bad things to happen to black people, like I think a lot of conservatives do. So I think that he just says the most, pot yeah, I do think that. I think uh, the mo he says the things that will get him elected. So I don't think that he has any personal grudges against uh, certain, you know, most people. That's an interesting take. Um, I don't know why everyone hated this guy. When I was watching everyone review these things, they hated this guy. I don't know. I'm pretty indifferent to him. He seems pretty basic and normal. Um, but I will say like, yeah, that's like, I don't know. The problem is, is that the problem is, is like, I'm not that convinced that I'll, hmm, I think most people, mm, they, oh, how do I say this? I do struggle, obviously, with the idea that people don't all hold biases and prejudice, meaning 
they have usually a lived experience or knowledge of X thing and they have a negative experience with X thing or a negative relationship with X thing. And so they're going to maybe not wish harm, but they're also not going to help or they're going to wish harm because they can't help it or they're not going to want to understand X enough to humanize X, enough to care about X, enough to not allow harm to happen to X. You know what I mean? When I have a conversation with somebody, <clears throat> and this is, again, why I think first date should be the reason not to get to a second date if you're seriously dating for marriage and not just, like, dating for fun, is because, again, how do I – okay, I'll tell you this. One time <laughs> – hold on, hold on, hold on. I just had dinner. Okay. Um, one time I was dating this guy, and he was white. And, and, um, we got into a fight about something. We, yeah, I had rocky relationships with everyone I dated. And he was like, you don't understand how hard my life is. Like, as a white man, I have it, like, the hardest. And I was like, oh, this is mental health, right? Like, you have to be mentally ill to think as a white man in America, you have it the hardest. Like, I genuinely think that's mental illness. Now, you as an individual white man might have a very hard life. But white men who actually think they suffered the most in America are suffering from mental health or they're so isolated in a bubble, this is all they see. Have some humility. You can't literally think you're an able-bodied white man is the most suffering group in America. You can't actually believe that. Though, of course, you can actually believe anything. But to believe that would mean that you are either having an experience of existence that's like this or with existence that's like this. Or you are so mentally ill, you can't understand the world around you. But that... You know, again, it was said in anger, so maybe he was just angry, but I was like, oh, you can't, that's weird. And I do assume it was mental illness, if I'm being honest with you, because it was too insane to say out loud. It's crazy. There's no evidence for it at all that that demographic suffers the most compared to others. And again, comparing suffering is hard. I don't want to compare how the event impacted you, because like that's not up for debate, but I want to be able to say like, yeah, I feel like... Kids who were starved as children had more hardship than children who were not starved as children, right? I want to be able to say like, yeah, that sounds harder, right? But if you go around eating a full belly every day and sleeping in a warm bed and you're like, I have it the hardest, it's like, do you have enough humility to know where you are on the spectrum of suffering? And everyone suffers, even Trump but he doesn't suffer in the same ways as every person. We don't suffer the same, but we do all suffer. And I think knowing that is important. So often I think it's a, it's a bitterness over the suffering. I'm white and I suffer and I'm black and I suffer and everyone suffers and I'm a man and I suffer and I'm a woman and I suffer. Totally. Everyone suffers. And until we acknowledge that everyone suffers, we're just going to keep suffering even more. Now, I don't have a, a real solution because I do think life itself is suffering. I just think you have to harm reduce the suffering. Suffer less. Let's work on suffering less. And the problem with that is that you first have to acknowledge that you're suffering in, in the real way you're suffering, not in the fake way you say you're suffering so you feel good about yourself. Like Fresh and Fit and Myron or not, no, no, sorry. Well, he's still a good example, but the other good example, God, what is that guy's name? Who's the white guy, guys, that debated on the whatever podcast with the pro-life girl? Oh, what's his name? He literally said, after his girlfriend cheated on him, he realized like he needs to become like an alpha male. It's like, or you can say that the consciousness that I was dating betrayed my trust and that hurt my feelings. And I would like to date somebody who doesn't lie or cheat or, or, or um, hurt my feelings. <laughs> 
<laughs> like no one ever goes to the solution of like you or you could just communicate and stop the bad behavior and um, not continue it. Everyone goes, I'm hurt, so I'm going to be meaner and crueler to everyone around me. What was that Ryan Reynolds movie, Just Friends? He was a fat guy who was bullied so hard by everybody that he left and became like a douchebag and became successful just to spite everybody. Spite can definitely get you places, but it's not joyful places. So again, are you going to worship money and Bugattis or are you going to, you know, look for joy? Are you going to have a good relationship with your consciousness? Are you going to say to yourself like, yeah, I value myself enough to not throw it away for money, not to throw away my values and not to blame the world for my suffering, but to acknowledge that the world does cause suffering. The world, I don't blame the world for my suffering. I'm rightfully identifying that I suffer more than I should because the world, certain parts of it, out of the goodness of their hearts, the road is paved in good intentions, causes suffering. And instead of condemning them for that, I'm hoping that they learn to humanize me enough to decide not to cause the suffering. But they might not. Again, much like Jordan Peterson says, ick, okay, this man is so fear-mongering. This man is so trapped in his own vortex of fear. He's always like, the left It makes everyone paranoid. Sir, you make people paranoid, sir. He's right, though. You should clean your room. Until I can get my parents to stop the suffering that they cause to their gay kids, I'm not going to try to fix the world, girls. That's your business. That's you. I'm trying to give you tools to help your family this election season. So I, you know what I mean? Because I'm going to go back and try to help mine. But this election season <clears throat> is already bringing out the worst in some of the people in my life. And I just want to make it clear that even though I don't do politics anymore, one of the ways that I'm going to remain sane and optimistic is remembering to humanize the people I love because I do love them while not backing down on my values. Because often what happens, and I mean this in the nicest way, people will see me being nice to conservatives and they'll think Brittany's a conservative secretly. My conservative friends will be like, Brittany's being nice to me. She'll be a conservative. You're all delusional. You're all crazy. You are all literally insane. Go to therapy. Just because I'm nice to you does not fucking mean we're on the same side. I'm just a better person than you because I'm able to treat you with dignity in a way you can't treat people who are different from you in the same way. So you think because I'm treating you with dignity and I'm humanizing you, I must be on your side. My progressive friends are like, Brittany's nice to conservatives. She must be on their side. You're all disgusting. You have all failed kindness in the world because you think me being kind to people is what makes me a conservative because I wouldn't be kind to conservatives unless I wasn't one. What? Where are your values? Do you treat people differently on the basis of their skin and their political affiliations? I treat all people with kindness. And at the same time, I put my foot down and I say, oh, even though I'm being kind to you, I need you to know very nicely, you're not going to get away with what you're doing. I'm sorry. I love you, but I'm not going to stand for this. But I'm not going to violently hurt them. I'm not going to advocate for violence. I'm going to use love and kindness like Jesus Christ herself. But I'm absolutely not going to fail my values because you're failing yours if kindness is a part of your values. I am so sick of people thinking I'm a conservative because I'm kind to people. I am nice to all of you. And I, okay, this election season, I just know it's going to get bad, girls. And I want to make sure that I'm not falling prey to that temptation of not being kind to people, but I still got to stay on my ground. And that's really hard. How do you stand your ground when people are literally looking at you saying, I'm going to deny you civil rights? And you still are kind. You kill them with kindness, girls. You kill them with love. Kill them with kindness. That's what you have to do. I love you. You're hurting me. I love you and I would love to talk to you. But when you talk to me like you see me and I know you don't, you're hurting me. When you have a parent or a sibling or a friend who literally looks at you and goes, I, you know, I really don't think you're gay. I really think if you just think about it longer, if you just, I just know you better than you know yourself. If you just, if you just know that I'm smart, I love you. You're not gay. 
I love you. Thank you so much for giving me that feedback. You need to discontinue this television series because I'm not watching anymore. I know who I am and I appreciate your feedback, but I think I'm good. And if they violate the consent, then you go, I'm open, but I have boundaries. Hey, I love you. And I love spending time with you, but I'm not going to talk to you about this subject. And if you would like to talk to me about this subject, I'm going to decline. And because I believe in consent, and I know you do too, we're going to move away from the subject matter. If we do not move away from the subject matter, we're going to have to see each other a little bit less. Not, I'm not cutting you off. I love you. But we're going to have to see each other less. And that's just going to be the way it is. And I'm okay with that. I hope you're okay with that. And they're like, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that. You have to talk to me. You have to let me tell you you're not really gay. And I'm going to sit there and be like, no, I don't. I love you. And then I'm going to skedaddle out of the situation. One of the reasons I live on my own and I work seven days a week so I never have to go back to my mom and dad is because I love myself more than anyone on this planet. And I will always choose myself and my joy. I will always choose Brittany because she is my best friend other than my husband. But he also agrees he will choose himself and then me. I will choose myself and then him. And then together we will choose each other. Because at the end of the day, if I abuse him, he should leave. If he abuses me, I should leave. Because we love each other enough and love ourselves enough to dignify our life enough to not consent to the abuse anymore. And that's what we're facing this election season. We're facing people who have our best intentions and are going to hurt us through loving us. And we have to love ourselves more and say, I love you, but I love me more and I'm going to see you later, okay? And that's really important. I love you, but I'm not going to sit here and let you tell me I'm not gay. I'm not doing it anymore. I don't have to. And that's what I worked all my life on, was getting into a situation in a position in life where I didn't have to sit in that room anymore because I had nowhere else to go. Being in a position where I had to sit in that room and listen to it because I had no money and no resources and no independence. Sitting in a space where if I didn't sit here and listen, I would lose my job. The reason I'm so fiercely independent is because I don't ever want to be in a position to the best of my ability. It's not perfect, right? We live in the world where I have to sit through someone gaslighting me about my existence. I did not work this hard to know myself, this hard to be independent for somebody, well-intentioned or not, to gaslight me about my existence. And that is exactly what will happen this election season. But everyone is going to do it. Progressives might do it to conservatives and conservatives might do it to progressives. But there is going to be a lot of gaslighting about your reality. So you better make sure you have the most facts about your own consciousness. Make sure you know the why. Why are you you? What makes you you? Which label truly identifies your consciousness? And is there a label that even can? Most people in my life have no idea I'm conservative. Mm, not for the lack of transparency or honesty about my values, but because I'm surrounded by liberals all the time and we get along so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that. When I was um, in BDSM land, and I loved Seattle, but damn, some of the progressives there were un just intolerable. I love them. Intolerable. Even though I agreed with them, I just, they were so intolerable. Um, my, I had a friend there who's like more libertarian, but like sexually progressive and him and I bonded because we both grew up conservative and we're both like kind of job focused. And at the same time, like we're very progressive, but, um, him and I found like safety with each other because again, like I did grow up conservative enough to like understand why people are conservative. There's a lot of beauty in that community, just like there's a lot of beauty in progressive communities. But when you don't fit perfectly, they bully you. That's why I don't like groups. I love being by myself. My company is the best company. I don't bully myself. But all of my friends, all of the people I've met through networking, all of the people I've known through work, eventually, if you do not exactly toe the line, they're going to look at you funny, which is why I'm always grateful for my inner circle because even though we disagree heavily, we're also able to humanize each other. But like 
we do disagree. I think like some people my my inner circle are unethical, but like okay. They don't follow my values. Why would they? Right? But you know, everyone's got to make peace with that. The problem is is like we're not killing each other. We're not trying to get each other fired. We're not doing any of those things. And that's the point. Let's get to the point in the world where like we're not killing each other and then we can talk about world peace. Ladies, what causes suffering? Living. Living. Consciousness. Awareness. Uh, feeling. Everything. Everything causes suffering. Suffering is an emotion. It's a feeling. It's a pain receptor processing. It's um, suffering is everything. Suffering is being alive. Suffering is life. Life is suffering. Beautiful, delicious, savory, warm suffering. Suffering is the basis for knowledge. It's the greatest tool for understanding. Unnecessary suffering is the greatest tool for cruelty, for malice. Proper suffering, reasonable suffering, that is the key to knowing the self. Unnecessary suffering is the key to becoming the ugliest version of yourself. Bitter, angry, unsatisfied. <sighs> uh, he just says the most popular thing. So I, I think like Ron DeSantis would be, yeah, Ron DeSantis would be somebody that I think you actually think wants black people to be hurt. So by that standard, yeah, Donald Trump supports black lives by leaps and bounds. You think Donald Trump says the most popular thing? Yeah. Really? Yes. So why do so many people hate him? He got elected as president. Yes, he did. Yeah. He didn't win the popular vote. Neither time. Uh, that's a that's liberal what talking your side point. Likes to say. <laughs> that's yeah. a liberal talking I'm point. helping you here. I, I, I'm trying to see the logic in this. Obviously, he says things to be, to be elected as a politician, very similarly to how Joe Biden did, except Joe Biden actually has a history of racism. <laughs> if he said things that people didn't like, he wouldn't have been our president. So you like everything that Donald Trump says? You think everything he says is popular? I love a lot of them. Look, I'm going to be really honest with you. I'm pretty sure Joe Biden has racism problems, right? It's like clear, which makes sense. He's an old white guy. Okay. Like, not to be a stereotype, but like, yeah, Joe Biden does have ideas about black people, the consciousness, like, not the consciousness. He doesn't even see the consciousness. Like, they're not, like, these people, these politicians, even these people who are in this room, none of them are talking about the consciousness, the real sense or entity of a person. They're all talking about the bodies they were put into, these bodies that decorate our souls or whatever you want to call it, right? Because like if you think you're your body, like we're having a different relationship with reality. So like ultimately, right, <sighs> Joe Biden obviously, obviously, obviously got some issues with black people. And at the same time, so do a lot of other people. And that's the problem is like people aren't willing to say like, yeah, I think I have bias and prejudice and I think I have some problems with like the stereotypes I feel around like groups of minorities. And I think we should talk about that. I think we should talk about how like sometimes when I'm dealing with a stereotype of a person, I do feel a way about it. I feel like a way about it. And I feel like that's the problem. But he can't because he's a politician. And so it slips out sometimes when the mask falls. And, and Trump can't say it. And none of us can say it. And no one's ever allowed to admit they're wrong. Because once you admit you're wrong, then you can never get better. Because the mob just wants to, like, crucify you. Which is why I'm saying, again, the tool I'm giving you is that you cannot depend on the mob to validate your existence. You have to understand yourself and criticize yourself and tear yourself apart and say, like, Oh my God, do I have problems with like black people? Do I have problems with white people? Do I have problems with men? You all know when I get pushed into a corner, I become a freaking anti-menist. I don't want to say misandrous because that's kind of harsh, but I do like look at men as sussy because men be the problems of everything. You know what I'm saying? And you got to admit you are causing wars. You guys claim you're in charge of everything and men are better at everything, but then is this better? Is this the better? Like, yes, life is great and I love this life. Like, I'm so lucky to be alive now. I can be on the internet and have a job. Great. But men are also the reason I have to fight to have a job and men are also the reason why, like, people have to fight for rights. And so it's exhausting. But at the end of the day, like, men are humans and they're just as dumb as the rest of us. So they're also stupid and yet in charge at the same time. It's so weird. 
it's the, the dichotomy is like the leaders are as dumb as the people. And we're in the symbiotic relationship of all being ignorant and stupid. And then we're all like, who's to blame? Ourselves? Us? Everybody? Because I don't think all men are malicious, but man, sometimes ignorance is malicious. You know what I mean? And so there's something, there's something to that that like really gets at me. That really like hurts me as a person. Because like, of course, I don't want to look at men like, oh my God, are you dumb? But when a man literally questions everything about a woman's experience, it's like, man, you don't even want to give us a chance. And then the worst is the kind of men that infantilize women are like, I love women. We need to protect them. No, no, you need to stop hurting them, ma'am. Like that guy who called into the panel I was on, he just like red flagged when he's like, all men love women. We love them. I'm sorry. What are we, a plant? You can love a plant. Don't be weird and be like, I love all women. What? Don't be weird. I love black people. Don't be weird. Don't be weird. It's weird when you say things like that. Like, I love X group. Don't, don't be weird. You're being weird again. Mm -mm, I don't like it. It's so uh, mm, sussy, sussy, sussy. Mm -mm, it's not good. So again, people have good intentions, but when they say things, it's like, mm, mm, okay, okay. And then again, when you're pushed into a corner, the stress comes out and you make an enemy where it doesn't need to be. But also you're like, just, okay, I'm trying to be the bigger person here. So just do, meet me where I'm at. But when people can't, it gets frustrating. Do not become ugly this election season. Stay in a zen, zen state. P.S. Join us for a three-hour meditation, one-hour discussion on my Discord on the 15th. Join Discord. Support the content. Join Patreon. We're doing a meditation, not guided, just a space to meditate. It really helps. You'll feel so much better about being alive. It's so good. It's just like nice deep breathing on your own. Just chill for three hours. and then. It just feels really great. My nice little space. I like doing it on the Discord because it like forces me to like sit still and like really focus. And then I remember, oh my gosh, I'm alive and no thing matters. Like guys, if I shut down this computer right now and I just sit in this room by myself, I'm like, oh, like everyone in the world is still doing what they're doing and they're all stressing about what they're stressing about. But I exist as a literal consciousness right here in this moment and nothing matters. It only starts to get stressful and frustrating when you have to deal with other people and those other people don't see you and don't hear you. And so they're kind of gaslighting you and you're like, sir. But then you realize like they can't help it because they literally feel like they love you and they want to love you this hard. And you're like, mm, mm -mm. and that's why you have to know yourself so you don't accidentally allow people to love you into insanity. People will uh, like coldly love you into insanity. And you have to be like, no. Hey, I love you. Sounds like you're going through something, but it's not about me. Absolutely not, ma'am. No, I'm not. Nope, this isn't. And they'll make it about you. They'll make it about you too. They'll be like, I'm voting this way because I'm trying to save you. I'm trying to save you. I'm a man. I'm trying to protect you. Don't you see? You're just a helpless woman. I'm trying to help you. And I'm like, mm. Don't you see? You're just a helpless black person. I'm trying to help you. Don't you see? You're just a stupid little man. I'm trying to help you. And I'm like, eh. mm. Mm -mm. no. Canceled. The things he says. I think he's hilarious. When he said big water, that was one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> big, big water. Water. Big water, ocean Big water. water. Uh, <laughs> oh. He has the funniest one-liner, so I love a lot of the things he says. As far as policy, he sucks, but. I'm just shocked wearing a Hunter Biden hat. He likes a different kind of one line. Oh, he's, I, I know, conservatives love talking about his No, uh, Coke, it's different, Coke, not. Trump is less of the issue and more so the people that support him, like Die Hard. They facilitate that kind of like hate, I think, for a lot of people, not just black people, but like. I mean, this man put, took out like a full page in a newspaper calling for the public execution of five black kids. His hotels, all of his businesses have ramp. Mm, okay. I will say, you know, when, um, when Trump did that, again, my values, again, I don't want to kill people. That's like a really big thing for me. I don't mind if people decide how to live and die themselves. That's your business. That's your body. But I, Brittany, do not want to live in a world where I have to kill somebody. 
I also don't want to advocate for the death of people. And I think it's, it's really interesting when people feel so secure about it. But I think I've been there. I've been in situations where I'm like, let's just kill all the like sex offenders. Kill all the child predators. Easy, right? And in some ways, it would be easy. Wrangle them up, throw them in a pit, let them die. Sounds pretty justified too. Like, look at me. I'm so, I'm so justified. But in order to do that, somebody would have to kill them. And it's, it's hard to justify killing people. But you say it's for the greater good. A lot of people think a lot of things are for the greater good, but what does the greater good mean? It's hard to know. Because obviously, I would love to save children from being harmed. But would that mean taking them out of every home that made them a little crazy? Would that mean taking them out of school if it was too stressful? Would that mean, you know what I mean? Like, what does harm mean? Obviously, we can take it down to like, don't do anything with children in an inappropriate way. But then child brides are a thing around the world. Okay, so what do we do with those people? Do we go into their countries and their religions and their homes and take their children away from them? Who's going to adopt these children? Because in some ways, I would love that. Like I watched this documentary about like children, child brides, and just thinking about it and watching it. No, wait, I take that back. Scratch that. It was a movie. It wasn't a documentary. It was a movie. I watched this movie on a child bride. And I literally just wanted to like, I thought I just wanted to, the parents to die because they were so willing to like farm away their little girl because they needed money and they couldn't feed the rest of the kids. In a survival situation, they're thinking, well, I have to feed all these kids, so I have to do this. Yes, but also no. You failed as a parent. If you had a child, you couldn't feed them, and so you sold them off to an older man. You failed. Yeah, you survived, but you're putting your children in a situation that is just so outrageous. And this happens all the time in real life. This isn't just a movie. And I just couldn't imagine not starving myself before I let that happen. And I couldn't imagine, of course, you don't want to starve to actual death because then who will take care of the kids, right? I understand. It's hard. But it's still not right. Just because life gets hard doesn't mean it's right. So life is hard. There are people in the world that will hurt your children. Does it make it right to kill them? I don't know. I think emotionally, yeah. I want to say if you assault a child, like you should die. What does it mean to assault a child if brides and grooms are being forced into arranged marriages in these situations? Do we kill the groom who was also forced into the situation or is he a victim too? Right? It's very difficult when you start getting down to it. But ultimately, the individual can make a decision. And in my life, I hope I never have to kill anyone and I will protect children at the cost of every adult life because children deserve that. Adults don't deserve that as much as children. Children are, are young, innocent, growing humans who deserve protection. And they deserve it, I think, more than adults do. Uh, history of denying black people apartments or whatever. So I forgot about that. I, I just, should not have stepped forward. Uh, look, I mean, Donald Trump cares about Donald Trump. Um, so I don't think he really cares about anyone, I guess, unless you're like super rich or whatever. When you look at his history on racial issues, whether it's the shitful countries comment, the plethora of comments he made about Mexican people, um, I just the comments he made about Muslims, the idea that Trump cares at, at all about some particular racial minority, I think is a little bit silly. I think Trump will say whatever he needs to say to rile up his base and to get elected. I don't necessarily think those statements come from a place of hatred. I don't think he was ever saying specifically, oh, if, if you pray five times a day towards the east or towards Mega based on wherever you are, you're a bad person. I think he was saying if you like to fly planes into towers or behead people or throw people off of buildings, maybe you're not the most virtuous person out there. I, I supported Trump because um, all, he, he made all of the, he made the economy good. And so the economy then impacted black people, white people, Latino people, it, it impacted everybody. But Trump, he didn't think specifically, I don't think, about black people. He thought about himself and he thought about how can I make America great for me? And, and, making, and, and, and I thought, you know what? I'm gonna go with this guy. And the reason I'm gonna go with this guy is because if he can make America great for, if, and he can make that it rise for everybody, I'm gonna benefit from that. So that's why I went, and that's why I voted for him. That's why I supported him. How does that specifically benefit black people? Again, he has, he's a businessman, but he's also a racist businessman, like well-documented so. So like, I just, 
Um, I've heard a few conservatives make this point that they do feel like Trump is out for himself. But as long as they're playing the same game as him, they don't care. I actually call this the Andrew Tate phenomenon. He's in the same bubble, right? We're like, as long as you're all grifting, you can all help each other get rich. So it doesn't matter. And that's the problem. When you choose what game you're playing, okay? If you choose the politics game, if you choose the ethics game, if you choose the religious game, if you choose, when you're choosing the game you're playing, you're asking yourself when things come to me and I'm tempted to go left or right or asked to go left or right, which way am I going to go, right? Which way am I going to go? And that's the question. And it is interesting because I'm sure you could get rich by networking with Trump. I'm sure there's a way to play the game with Trump so it benefits you. But see how the game of politics, do you guys, oh, I love this. Do you guys remember when George W. Bush Sr. died and they were all at the funeral and Trump wasn't, in, he wasn't invited, right? That was the one where he didn't get to go. Is that the funeral where he didn't get to go, but Barack Obama and George Bush were sharing candy with each other and sitting with each other like schoolgirls? Wake up. Your favorite YouTubers that hate each other networking behind the scenes and or not that's why that's why it's so funny to me when people pretend like I can't believe you're tolerant of x y and z girl don't act like you're all not using each other for views and making money and like pretending to grift and make enemies and like go back and forth Just, please stop so tired such a tired shtick but then the fans fall for it and everyone falls for it and there's no like this isn't about values this is about fucking making money which is fine but like you're in that bubble. So if you're playing the Trump game, like Trump is your best friend. If you're playing the grift game, Andrew Tate's your best friend. If you're playing the pretend I'm a good person, it's like, oh God, I'm so exhausted. It's like, look, but choose your bubble. Choose your game. So I I chose be joyful and focus on Britney and um, like enjoy my life. I chose no fame. I don't want that. I want to be successful at my job, but I don't need to be famous to do that. I love being a YouTuber. I can be like a basically an unknown YouTuber and still make really good money because I have a really great audience and I have good viewership and that's awesome, but I don't have to be famous. I don't want that kind of money. I don't need to be Andrew Tate. Awesome. I don't have to grift. Great. I don't have to do, I don't have to be friends with people that are liars. Awesome. But, you know, I obviously am friends with liars because li everybody lies, apparently. I, I realize so much on Neurodivergent TikTok how so much of my brain might just be too neurodivergent to understand. Or maybe I just don't want to play the game. I just don't want to play the game where I have to lie all the time. I'm not going to be able to keep up with my lies, guys. It's too much work. I'm not going to remember what I said yesterday. I'd rather just tell the truth and go with that. And then, of course, like maintain privacy and all that stuff all the same. But it is interesting. Mm. It is interesting. And a lie means like a direct lie. Like if somebody asks me, um, well, if somebody asks me something I don't want to answer, I just want to answer it, right? But if somebody, like, why would I need to lie in a living situation? I can't think of a scenario where I would have to lie in a living situation. But lots of people lie, like small talk, like you're at the grocery store and someone's like, oh, where are you going? And if you're heading to the strip club, you might just say like, oh, I'm going to my mom's house. That's a lie. But maybe you do it because you don't want to, I would just say like, oh, I'm just going out. So I just learned to, you know, it just like, oh, I have so much anxiety over the idea of just like keeping up with the lies. It's it's too much work. Anyways, politics is a lying game. Politics is a grifting game. Politics is a us versus them branding game. That's why it doesn't matter how many of these Trump or anyone else has a controversy. It doesn't matter. Your controversies don't matter in this game. What matters is winning because people want to be on the winning side. So again, if you want to play this game, you can. But, you know, is Trump... Does he support black people? It's more like, do black people benefit Trump? You know what I'm saying? If they're going to be basically anti-Trump, then no. But if yes, then yes. I don't think it's that deep. And Biden's not? <laughs> Biden's not? When, yes, when he Biden, is. He yeah. created the crime okay. bill. So, so that's, but that's, that's regardless so of the point. Just the Central Park Five. That's what you brought up, right? Yeah. How do you feel about that? Well, actually, okay, so, they were so, so I haven't He wanted them to be killed. Well, executed. Just because, just because they were black. That story. And but, he, he, yeah. He bars people from attending his businesses or like renting apartments from all his like stupid Trump towers. I just like. I think Trump at that point was like many people in this room, particularly liberals, a victim of the media. I think he was scared. I think he was ashamed of the things that he heard in the news and wanted to take action himself as a businessman, not as a. Why racist. are you infantilizing him? I also I don't like also real quick because people keep. Mm. We might need to infantilize him because he's just like he's kind of good bad at business. I don't think Trump is bad at business. I think he's good 
was good at business, maybe more than he is now. But I will say that like he is getting older and the game has changed a lot. But there was a Trump I grew up with that was really good at business. And so I don't know if he's actually good at business or not. Like Andrew Tate is great at business. It blows my mind how good this guy grifts. It actually blows my mind at how easily he was able to turn the narrative in his favor and everyone just like went with it. I'm like, how did he do that? How did he get? I'm that's amazing. That's amazing. When you can convince millions of people who didn't like you before to kind of like you, I'm like, that is amazing. And it's all on the lie. It's all on a lie. Like Andrew Tate is like one of the greatest scammers I've ever seen. And I was, I literally didn't think much about him when I first saw him because I was like, this is such an easy shtick to see through. Holy fuck. Oh my God. No. What is going on? Why? <laughs> like, what? It's crazy. It was crazy. He was never good at business. He went bankrupt multiple times. I mean, you can go bankrupt and still be good at business. Like, I think, look, as a as somebody who's seen a lot of businesses go up and down, most businesses don't make it past the first five years in America. So again, I don't think we're all defining good and bad the same. A good businessman who became president, like, that's good business, y'all. He became president. That's good business. Like, I don't know what you're judging him on, but filing for bankruptcy doesn't mean he's necessarily bad at business. So what's the goal of the business, right? Like, he's an unethical business person, in my opinion, based off of my ethics. He's maybe could be more efficient if you played the game differently. But like, look, even big fish got to become small fish eventually. Eventually, people come and replace the Trumps, right? So I would say that he just like, he's playing some games very badly. Like Biden plays games better in politics. Like he's more, he's better at playing a lot of the games than Trump. But Trump and Biden, I would argue, are playing different games, even though they're playing under the same umbrella. Does that make sense? Maybe. Something like that. You know what I mean? I think that's the problem is like, what are we rating this on? Is that why people get mad at you for not playing the YouTube game? I think people get upset with me for not playing the YouTube game because they don't believe me when I say I'm not dependent on it. Like I'm playing the YouTube game right now by like streaming five days a week and working seven days a week. That's a part of the YouTube game and I'm happy to do it because it's within my values. So I have to stream more. Cool. Let's play this game, girls. Let's hang out more. Oh my God. Oh no. I have to hang out more. <laughs> like I'll play this game. It's a little too like a spoon um draining but it's also really stimulating so I'm, I'm kind of like as long as I can eat and drink water and take bathroom breaks like I think I'm gonna be fine but that is a version of the game that I'm willing to play because I sat down with myself I meditated really hard and I was like okay Brittany we have to be good at our job and our job is a job so how do I be good at the YouTube game well I can stream that I can do I can go on panels that I feel comfortable going on. Like Wick invited me to multiple panels, but I said no to a lot of them because I was like, I'm not qualified to talk about this. I don't feel like I can share anything about this. These are all political panels. I don't feel comfortable. But when I found a panel I liked, I loved being there. So Wick is really great because he allows me to like, he's very open to the fact that I'm like, oh, I don't like, I can't do this panel, but I can do this one because I don't want to be somewhere I feel like I can't contribute. If I was playing a different YouTube game, I would show up on every panel I was asked to be on. If I was playing a specific YouTube game, I would show on, on I would show up on every single panel Wick invited me to. But I'm not playing that game. I'm being very strategic and only saying yes to the panels that I actually think I can contribute some good things to. If I don't think I can contribute to the conversation in a real way, I'm not going to do it, which is a different game. That means every time people see me, they they're going to see me performing pretty well because I'm actually going to want to be there. If I showed up on panels where I didn't have much to say, I would just be that, no offense, that kind of streamer that just like shows up to be there. So everyone knows your name, but you don't provide content. That's not how you build an audience. You build an audience by providing content so it's worth their time. And so that means I have to be able to talk, right? So I want to make sure that when I'm providing content, I'm actually providing content. Otherwise, I don't want to waste your time, girls. Mm -mm. And look, I love watching my streamers in the background. I love watching Kyla. I love watching Papa God. I love watching my people when I do stuff. And I hope that I am that for you. I hope that you love watching me in the background. I hope you're cleaning your house and doing your hair and playing your video games while you're hearing me in the background. 
but I, again, am trying to provide a service that coincides with my values. So I won't be the YouTuber you'll see on every podcast. I'll be the YouTuber you see on select podcasts. Like there are definitely some podcasts I hope I get on one day, but I'm not trying to get on every single one. I'm just trying to get on specific ones because I'm also trying to build like a specific audience of people because I want to invite the right energy into the comments. Why does every YouTuber who sees my comments say that, wow, Brittany's audience is so optimistic. They're so nice. They're so open-minded. Because I am inviting those people into my space. My audience always gets complimented. Other YouTubers always notice that my audience is exceptionally nice. And I that's on purpose, y'all. That is 100% on purpose. I try really hard as the content creator to invite and encourage a really, really optimistic audience. That's the game I'm playing. How do I get optimistic, open, curious people? How do I get strong, independent thinkers? And how do I maintain my values or making a dollar? Those are the things that I'm focused on. I don't want to be famous and I don't want to be very rich. I want to create a really, really stable community of open-minded, curious people. And I think I have gold star. I think I did that. I did do that. You know what I mean? I'm pretty happy about that. Okay, let's keep going bringing up this comparison to the 93 crime bill from Biden. That crime bill, this was at the height of like violent crime and the crack epidemic in the United States. The Congressional Black Caucus supported that crime yes. bill. Everybody in the United States supported that crime bill. Mm -hmm. The idea that that crime bill was like some racist piece of legislation that Biden was just wheeling out because he hates black people and that's somehow comparable to the, the Donald Trump's treatment of the Central Park Five that were already exonerated, that, that wasn't a victim of the media. The media said they were they were done. They were exonerated in court. They weren't there. Where, As where I understand they it, the prosecutor of, the, of the, the, the five, they actually, he was a black guy. And so in being a black guy, he went and he looked at all the evidence and said, These these guys are guilty. Black people can also be racist against other black or people. Or just make mistakes. <laughs> so if anybody okay. does anything you disagree with in regards to the Central Park Five, even if they themselves are a black person, they're, oh, they're just a self-loathing black person. They're just a racist black. Maybe. This happens. That's why I say you have to be really open to being wrong. There's no way we can know the objective truth of most scenarios because we're not really open to being very, very, very open. Look, I am super, super open. Sometimes I'm so open that people literally think I'm agreeing with them in the moment, but no, I'm just exploring the idea with you bros. I'm just exploring the idea, but that's why I love my callers because I'm like, okay, so just to make sure it's not a you problem, let's let's examine it, but I could be wrong. And then it takes the caller who's really, really open to being introspective about their consciousness who goes, okay, wait, maybe it is me, girl. And I go, ooh, and then we laugh about it. And I'm like, okay, we can fix this, no problem. When you're willing to admit it's you, everything becomes easy. And it's always you, even when it's not you, because you're the one who has to set the boundaries. The problem is them, but the problem is you. And you are them and they are you. So when your family, the selection season, comes up to you once again, and they're like going down your throat with their opposite politics of you, and they're telling you, this is how it has to be. Yes, see how they're coming at you, but then it's on you to say, I love you. I'm open with boundaries. And I'm going to set a boundary for my own sanity. The boundary is for you. It's not for them. You're not giving them the boundary. You're giving yourself the boundary. I, Brittany, don't hang out with people who deny and gaslight me about my sexual orientation for longer than I want to be there. And the moment I don't want to be there, I go, thanks. And I walk away. One of the greatest stories Abba and Preach ever told, I related to Abba so hard here. Abba and Preach tell this story. This is an old story where they were in a circle talking and Abba just like, mm -mm. he like just walked away. He's like, mm -mm. and then just walked away and Preach was like, and he had to get used to Abba just being like, mm -mm. that's why I like Abba so much. And he's such a good person. I love Abba. He's such a good person. And we, we have like similarities in that way where we're like, mm, no. Like we're, no. And like, there's something about that and people I really, really love because people are so pressured to adapt to the bubble so hard that I really like people that are like, mm, no, I'm not going to have this conversation anymore. And they just walk away. <laughs> I just love that so much. And like, that's what it is. It's about you. Like this doesn't serve me. I'm going. So yeah, you can blame everybody else, but maybe you are being self-loathing. Maybe you do have internalized racism. That's why I always say that I haven't, like, I have internalized misogyny. 
Like, I suffer from toxic masculinity. I sometimes suffer from, like, toxic masculinity, internalized, and sometimes misandry even, because there are parts of me that, like, want to speak through my trauma, and they want to speak through my lived experience. And I haven't had very many good experiences, but I've had enough that are just over the bad, but not really. So here's the problem. In terms of numbers, I have had bad, more bad experiences with men than good ones, but the good ones trump the bad ones. Does that make sense? I have had more bad experiences with men than good ones, but the good ones I have had trump the bad ones. Even though they're less, they're higher in quality. Does that make sense? So I can have a bunch of bad experiences with men that are tolerable enough that I'm like, okay, like, no. But also, like, as long as you don't murder me or grape me, like, we're good. But that doesn't mean I'm having a good experience. Like, if I'm in a group of people, and I've had this happen a lot, you're in a group of people of men, and you're all having a fun time, and you're laughing, and the men are just, like, belittling you and belittling you and belittling you, and you're sitting there, and you're like, hmm, yeah, okay, I get it. Like, you're not hurting me, but you're making it clear that you're playing a game of dominance. Okay. Yeah. This isn't a good experience for me because this isn't how I treat people. I don't have a conversation with people where I'm whipping my dick around. But men do that sometimes, some kinds of men. And I've had a lot of those experiences and I don't like them. So I would say that's a bad experience with a man. But it's not like the worst experience. I'm like, okay, that's a bad experience. But the, the it's such a low on the totem pole of seriousness that I'm like, okay, move aside. But the good experiences I've had with men are so quality that they make like 10 of those experiences feel like one. Does that make sense? Does that kind of, does that translate? Let me know. Person. If they disagree that with me, they're racist. Doing his job. That's, that's my policy. If they disagree with me, they're racist. I, like I, that. I think so Trump, is, yeah, I like think Trump has policy. shown a history of ignorant at best and racist at worst behavior. I didn't vote for him or Hillary because I just don't see him as a conservative hero. I don't even think he's a conservative. Uh, Fake conservative. I voted Trump in 2016, just so you all know. So I'm just saying. So I need to exp I need oh. you to elaborate on him. Oh, very unique group of people. So, okay, hold on. Let me switch actually. So we've got a Trump voter. We've got someone who didn't vote Hillary or Trump. I like that. I like that. That's okay. That's cool. Mm -hmm. People disagree with you. They're racist oh, just in wait, general. Wrong. I was just, <laughs> just uh, yeah, yeah. You never know. Just like I had, kind of it's, it's, sorry if I triggered you. I'm sorry. You made no, a point, sure. you made a, point no. okay. uh, a couple minutes back where you said um, he just kind of says these things to rile up his base. Um, why does he need to do that at the expense of black people then? He doesn't do that at the I, I am a member of his base and I'm sitting there like, oh man, this is amazing. And I don't know, you can call me self So, calling, you can call me so you're saying you can call me calling for the public stupid. execution of five black men that were exonerated to When has he done that base. during the campaign trail? He didn't do that when he was a politician. Well, he again, did that when he was a it's everything, in New York. It's everything Steve said about the comments about Muslims, the comments about uh, Mexican immigrants. Why does never he... about Mexican immigrants, never about Muslims, about terrorists, and about criminals and rapists. I, These are very important delineations to make. And if you believe I that... I think you understand. Okay. I'm going to pretend I'm like how Trump talks a little bit silly, but like... Imagine I get on this YouTube channel and I say, um, and I say, oh, I'm trying to think of a stereotype. If I say like all men, no, no, no. I have to say, God, it has to be a specific thing. People with penises. <laughs> Uh, I got to say it in a certain way. See, it's, that's the problem is like Trump. OK, but that's the problem is we all talk this way because sometimes the way I talk, even people take it the wrong way. But Trump, the way you talk has some lived experience in the way you talk. So I'm trying to think of a stereotype or like a generalization I could make like Trump does. Trump says it in a way where he's obviously like fan servicing to his. I watched a lot of anime. I know what a fan service is. OK, he does fan service to his audience. And his audience is racist and and they want to think like I'm the good kind of Mexican and you're the bad kind of Mexican and I'm the good kind of immigrant and you're the bad kind of immigrant and I'm the good kind of gay and you're the bad kind of gay and I'm the good kind of man, you're the bad kind of man. So, which is everybody, but like, okay. So he has to cater to that experience. See, I hate politics because you're playing the game of like how to get the base up, but you're not looking for truth. You're not looking for introspection you're not looking for joy you're not looking for peace you're not looking for love you're not looking for 
anything wholesome. You're looking to win and make the base feel fiery. And then you're looking to bully. So the dilemma is that like, I, I think that's why I'm trying to make it really clear this upcoming season that I'm happy to talk to people that are different from me, but I don't want to fight you politically. I want to say that I think that your ideas are bad, but I think most people's ideas are probably like bad, but only because they think their idea is right for everyone. If you think your idea is right for everyone, like I don't know how to talk to you. You've already lost me, right? So Trump feeds fuel to the fire for an audience that wants to hear that he hates the same people they hate. Sounds like a problem. AOC and the four horsemen of the left, they always talk about this too. Like there are these group of people that are like, look at us, we're badass. We're going to come together and we're going to fight the people we hate. And I'm like, do you think we've all lost the plot since we're fighting people we hate who are just our neighbors? Like, don't you think that's weird that like the people we hate that we're trying to take down are just like people we work with? Does that feel weird? Like, it's diff. It's it's hard. It's hard to. It's just not within my values to not be kind to people. And if they're unkind to me, I just create the boundary where I'm not going to be kind again. Right? Or like I'm going to be kind less because I won't interact with you as much. But when Trump gets on stage and he says things that inflame a base to feeling vindicated in their racism or homophobia or sexism, he's playing to an audience that is already that, even if they don't want to say it out loud. Like I said, my parents agree. They'll admit they didn't teach us their language because they didn't want us to have an accent because having an accent in America limits your job opportunities and people treat you badly, but they won't say it's because of racism. So it's like when you talk to a base that is like, it's not racist for me to hate Mexicans. I'm like, I, I'm i a Mexican and I hate them. I'm an immigrant and I'm sick of immigrants. I used to talk, I used to literally talk this way all the time. I get it. I think when progressives say, um, when progressives say like, not all men, but like all men, what they're saying is, hey, obviously like not, not you being a man, like it's not because you're a man that you're doing this. It's men who are trained under the patriarchy. So obviously if you're in queer circles or gender fluid circles or you're dealing with someone who's a biological male and they're like gender fluid or something, if they operate within being oh, – how do I say this? Oh, I, I don't know how to talk except in the bubble of the progress. I'm sorry. Like I'm just going to talk like myself and you guys can figure out how to translate it. Let me know in the comments if you need help. Basically, you know how I always say I'm not into men and I'm not into women? I'm not into people that are trained to be men and women. People who adhere to the training of what they have to be as a man or a woman are people so in a box that they're not going to work with my fluidity. I am only interested at most of romantically dating people who are not men or women, but are obviously a man or I'm obviously a woman. But I do not adhere to the training that I was given to be a woman or told I would have to do to, to graduate the class of being a woman. So when you buy into those stereotypes and you don't fulfill them, of course, the mob's going to be like, why aren't you performing like the rest of us? It's a game of jealousy. People are jealous that students might get forgiven their debt because they didn't get their debt forgiven. People are jealous that people are getting here illegally because they didn't have that option. People are jealous and upset that people didn't have to suffer the way they suffered. And I think that's what leads to bitterness. I'm not jealous that you took a different path than me. I'm happy with my path. But if we can give people options in the future that are easier for them, we should do that. I don't think it's easier to illegally come into a country necessarily. I think that's an illusion created by the conservative movement to convince people that it's e it's not easier, right? Like, I don't know why you're saying that. It just might be a shorter span of time, but it sounds a lot harder, in my opinion, to come over here illegally to America than not, in my opinion. It sounds horrible to try to do that, but it's shorter, and that's why people are willing to do it because time versus, you know what I mean? Time is the, the wager they're making. 
but I don't think it's easier. I think it like for me, I would just wait it out because that's easier for me than walking miles in the desert with no water and carrying my kids through freaking whatever nature elements. Like, no, thank you. Okay. So when progressives say, or somebody would say, or if I said, like, I I really don't like men. What I'm saying is I don't particularly enjoy men who are trained to be men and adhere to that training and never think about themselves outside of that stereotype of being a man. I don't enjoy women who adhere to the training of being a woman, who don't rebel against the training they've been given. I don't love like women who are obsessed with being a good woman. Like, you know those TikToks you'll see where the woman is like, do you want to be a good woman and attract a man? This is how you attract a man. It's like, no, I don't want to attract a man. Thank you. And also, if you see those TikToks where they're like, men, do you want to attract a good woman? No, I don't want to attract a woman. I want to attract a person who happens to be a man or a woman. I want to attract a good consciousness. I'm not, I understand it's complicated. I understand there's a lot of nuance here. But I do think when you're talking to an audience, they're going to hear you the way they hear you. And Trump knows how his audience hears him. And so he plays it up. I don't know if he actually believes any of it. He just plays it up. I know for me, I believe it. So I say it, but people don't always get it. You know what I mean? When I say like conservatives are a part of the reason that I really dislike existing, I don't mean every conservative, right? Use your brain. What I mean is people who fight for policies that deny LGBT people their rights, their ability to adopt, their ability to have jobs, their ability to express themselves, people that are anti-sex work, people that are anti-independence, people that are anti-bodily autonomy. Yeah, you make my life harder. I don't know what to tell you. And you know you do. Why are you pretending you're not voting for policies or the politicians that are going to support policies that deny people their choices just because you want a bigger tax cut or you want some sort of like, you know, oh, I'm fiscally conservative and liberally. I get it. You're choosing money over social issues. Fine. But again, I don't know why we're playing this game. Just say it. I would love it if people just say, yeah, dude, uh, sorry about your civil rights and everything sucks, but I'm going to vote for a tax write-off. Like, I just say it. It would make me feel so much better about my life. I'd be like, oh, thanks, bro. I appreciate the honesty. Just say it. But they can't because they have to play into this narrative of like, I'm not anti-immigrant. I'm not anti-illegal. I just want people to follow the rule. Or I'm anti-illegal because I want people to follow the rules. The same rules that you're always looking to break or different rules you want to break. We all want to break the rules, girls. Okay. It's just we all fight over which rule we're breaking. But come on. Okay. I am in nobody. I've never met a person who didn't like to break a rule. We're all just debating over which rules we're allowed to break. Mm. About, or, oh, it's all Mexican it's, immigrants. I think it's more of you being, oh man, oh, these poor Mexicans, they need to be supported. It's more of that savior what complex. Wow, what was we're the back rationale again. behind axing or trying to ax DACA? Where those these people were registered with the federal government, they were in school, they were doing everything that they needed to do. They had no home elsewhere. They were brought into this country as minors. Like, what's the explanation for I that? I think like, that requires more nuance. Like I mentioned before, I think there were some people. Education. I think Why there were some people feeding him bad policy advice, thinking, oh, this will be really good for your base, and he's doing a lot. As just a president. That's okay. That's okay if we feel that way. So, so if so if I so if I take responsibility for something, if I say he has responsibility for something, well then you're right. But if I'm saying, well, maybe there's some people around him advising him falsely. Dude, it's infantilizing. He was the president. There's no good way. He to called the way. shots. What are you talking about? The only path forward to solving illegal immigration starts with amnesty for everybody here. The reality is there's some 10 to 15 million illegal immigrants here. We're not deporting them all. With the people who are already here, it, that's a lot more of a messy, nuanced conversation. Um, but as far as people coming in, I do think we need stronger borders and actual like vetting happening. And I just want to say, um, in, in Ronald Reagan's day, he was given the promise. He was. He said, look, if, if you go ahead and you pass this particular bill, we'll give these people amnesty and we're done. And it, it didn't happen. We didn't, uh, uh, illegal immigration continued even after Reagan already said we will give these people amnesty. So that's why we get a burr up our butt because um, he had already done it. Hopefully the devil's giving him amnesty. That's, True. That's oh, terrible. That's, no, that's, no, that's base, thank you. Tasteless. Wow. wow. Ninth circle, baby. My political beliefs have changed from the past. Mm, I'm excited about this one. My political beliefs have changed from the past. I grew up in a conservative household, actually, in Ohio. And uh, my parents were always pretty political, so I'm, uh, I always stayed political. I was very religious uh, as a teenager. Uh, sometime during college and then afterwards, especially during COVID, um, my sister actually indoctrinated me into uh, a more leftist uh, position. And uh, 
I overcorrected a little bit. I started becoming pretty cringy as far as like, you know, sit down and let, you know, let the minorities all talk, right? Um, don't say anything, don't speak over them, et cetera. They would, you know, it was like the whole, you can't speak over Candace Owens even if she's literally a Nazi kind of thing. So um, I, <laughs> I, I stand by that. So um, yeah, I, I kind of leveled out thankfully and I'm less cringe now. And, Did you? Are you? I cringed. Yeah. This is leveled yeah. out. Imagine if we would have been here a year ago. You yeah. can, yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe I am being cringe, who cares? I, I, um, so I grew up conservative, but I did have more left-leaning ideas about like Black Lives Matter and critical race theory. And I was kind of, I was watching a lot of YouTube and you know, I did agree that black people were oppressed and all of these different things and that we were kind of got the short end of the stick. And um, during 2020, when there was, you know, everything crazy was happening and I started uh, organizing rallies against uh, the mandates because I thought that they were just totally unconstitutional and un-American. And then George Floyd dies and initially I was like enraged like everybody else. And then it started to become this weird like, um, political like agenda masquerading or behind his face <laughs> like it just the face of what was actually happening started to peel off <laughs> and i was like oh i mean i would counter protest blm activists at my town square when i lived in texas and they were some of the most just bitter vile horrible people you could ever meet meanwhile like the confederate group that would protest there against them also they were like the nicest people ever to me mm -hmm. ironically i've had this experience i've had this experience i have had some of the worst experiences in my life with progressives and some of the best experiences in my life with conservatives. I've had some of the worst experiences in my life with conservatives and I've had some of the best experiences in my life with progressives. So, so, if you only have a few experiences, you only have a few like points of data. If you only meet one man and this one man is the only man you've met and he stabbed you, then of course you're going to think, well, I don't know about those men. You have to meet more people. You have to create good and bad memories with more people, different kinds of people. And you've got to realize like people are people everywhere. The moment those conservatives see you as a progressive, girl, they're not going to be nice to you. In the same way, those progressives weren't nice to you because you were a conservative black girl. Don't you get it? The moment you're not on their team, They'll burn you at the stake. That's the point. The moment you're not on their side, they'll look at you a little funny. The moment you don't fit with the mob, they'll be like, hmm, I don't know about this one. They'll call you a grifter. They'll see you as a fake. They'll think you're a secret so-and-so. It's so funny how we seek validation so badly that we'll seek it from people that are just nice to us for a moment. Is that all it takes? someone to be nice to you for a moment and on this whole planet of 8 billion people you couldn't find two progressives that were nice to you sounds like a you problem like i said i've had some of my cringiest moments with the progressives some of the worst ways i've been treated have been by progressives it seems about equal with the conservatives though and when i'm in a certain mood i don't want to talk to the progressives and when i'm in a certain mood i don't want to talk to the conservatives and when i'm in another mood i don't want to talk to any of you the best company I've ever had in this world is my own and my partner's. Otherwise, everybody is very annoying the moment you disagree with them. Are you sure you think that way? Are you positive? I just feel like you've changed. Are you sure? I just feel like I know you better. Are you sure? This can't be how you think. I know you're saying that, but you can't really think that. Are you fucking crazy? And they are. Everyone is crazy. Everybody wants you to just agree with them so they feel validated in their own beliefs. And the moment you don't validate their beliefs, they're like, who is this person? Have they lost their mind? Are they crazy? They can't think this way. No, no, no. They, they, they can't think. Something must have happened. Girl, I've had this happen. And it will happen again and again and again. I've, ha I've said the same exact thing on my YouTube channel. And it's true. It is a fact. But it, I'm not saying I've had horrible instances with progressive people to uplift the conservatives. The conservatives are also awful. I grew up in a, dem in a democratic, not a democratic household, but kind of apolitical, but everybody was Democrat. And then I, I, I got a job. And when I got a job and I saw all the taxes come out and, this, and I started looking to the left and to the right and going, oh, my money's whittling away over here. And I said, you know what? After Reagan, I'm just going to go ahead and declare myself a Republican. And I've been a Republican ever since. My mom is pretty liberal. My, she married my stepdad when I was like 15, 16 in high school. And he's super conservative, like loved Trump, diehard Trump fan. And um, they had a lot of like back and forth hearing the two sides, like people who are on such polar opposites, just like argue 
all the time about stuff, seeing that there's a lot of similarities in both sides, like the far radical left and the far radical right, they have a lot of similarities. They just don't want to come and like see it. I started off, actually true, kind of like true, you, true. I went to a Jesuit high school. Um, I grew up very Um, he went to a Jesuit high school? Interesting. Interesting. Conservative. My mom uh, is Cuban, so ride or die Bush supporter, who is now a ride or die um, Trump supporter. I think the point of my life when I was the most like libertarian was probably the lowest point of my life financially. <laughs> and I think it's because something that conservatives do really well is they make you feel like you can always like succeed as long as you work hard enough. And that's something that progressives and liberals suck at. That you're a victim of systemic racism. You're black, so you're going to be discriminated against. You're a woman, so nobody's going to care about your feelings, etc., etc., etc. Whereas Republicans will tell you, listen, if you work hard, you can do whatever you want, like just as long as you're willing to put in the work. And I felt that way up to the moment where I was losing my house, where I had an ex-girlfriend that was pregnant, where I had been fired from my previous job. There was a whole bunch of horrible stuff going on. In my my life and I very very luckily got into online content creation and from there as I started to make more money I started to pay more taxes when I get older and I look at taxes that come out of my paycheck um, I just I mean I care a little bit but it was just so funny to me that back when I was making 15 20 thousand a year I'm like I gotta vote for the lower tax bracket blah 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 like I'm barely paying any tax anyways and you know now that I'm older like if the government wants to take you know a few you know 10 20 whatever how many more thousand dollars out you just said you worked hard so I did but I got think, very 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 lucky doing so very lucky do you think it's just luck it's not just luck but the difference is that mm, okay you have to play, you have to work hard and you have to be good at the game you're playing. If you're not good at the game you're playing, it won't succeed. I think a lot of people are just playing the wrong game. So they, so the politics is hard. So politics is a layer to your game. So you have yourself, you have your consciousness and on top of yourself, you have like all these toppings. Okay. You're the, like the base of the cake. And then you have all these layers to it, right? You have the first layer and then you add on the second layer and third, and then you start putting frosting and decorations and candles and the whole thing, right? But what happens is, is that she's right. Like you work hard, you will succeed if you're playing the right game, if you have the right resources, if, 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 and then destiny's right. It's, it's luck. If you're lucky enough, if this, if this. And so it is always an if, it's not a just, if you just work hard. No, it's a if you work hard and if this and if this and if this, which is fine. That's normal. All of my ancestors had the same game of if. And I think what happens is people pick the wrong games. That's why you're having midlife crises at 45 to 55. It's why you wake up one day and you're like, why did I go to college? It's why you wake up one day and you're like, why did I choose this religion? It's why you wake up one day and you're like, am I even a man? It's why you wake up one day because you've never asked yourself enough questions along the path that you spent years just following the script you were given, which is fine. Lots of people are very comfortable with the script. And then you wake up one day and you're like, what if I did something different? But then it shatters everything you've built. So you're starting from scratch, like step one again. And that's what's so difficult. Starting from scratch again is very hard. I'm very good at it. I've restarted my life so many times. And I feel like I'm so good at it. That's why I'm not afraid to lose everything. Because I'm like, cool, I'll just build it up again. I'm really good at doing that. I'm really good at rebuilding my life 100 times over. Because what's happening is I think you have to rebuild your life again and again when you pick the wrong games. That's why I really meditated on this, guys. I did like this four hour meditation. I really thought about it. I wrote out like this whole journal post to myself about what I was doing here. Why am I streaming five days a week? What is my goal? What's the audience I want? What game do I want to play on YouTube? I really had to ask myself. I couldn't just wake up and be myself because when I do that, I do have an audience, but I don't have a job. I do make content, but it's not like a business. So when I told myself, okay, what am I creating? What's the content I'm offering my viewers? I want to give you tools. I want to give you tools for your life as an individual as a consciousness in the universe who knows like we're just here for a moment and then we're going to die. So how do we play the game correctly and how do we choose the right game for us? It's so specific to who you are. And the greatest part is like you have the answer. It's within your consciousness. You just got to figure it out. So if you're lost and you don't know what to do, you don't know yourself. You don't even know yourself. When we're lost, we have lost a sense of understanding of our consciousness. You feel lost and inadequate and like you don't know what to do because you don't know what to do. Because you don't have you to refer to. You don't have the ability to say, Brittany, what are we doing? Or X, what am I doing? Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? And they go, oh. I align myself back into my, my consciousness. I'm like, oh, never mind. We know what we're doing. But that fear, it comes over me sometimes where I'm like misaligned with myself and I start to listen to other people and I'm like, stop. 
oh yeah, we know what we're doing. All the evidence shows we're doing the right thing. But the world will be screaming at you. The people closest to you will be screaming at you. Do it my way. Do it my way. Do it my way. Do it my way. And you have to look at them and say, I love you. No, thank you. I love you. No, thank you. I have to do it my way. The way I've always done it. Because I have a relationship with me. It's about me. It's not about you. You are a part of it and I'll keep you in mind because, you know, I'm living a life, but it's about me. My YouTube channel is about you guys. I keep you in mind. I think about your health and I'm like, okay, where are they at? How do I make sure that I'm never like being too moody, but also like being realistic? Like I don't, I'm not a negative, pessimistic person. So how do I like, but I'm also kind of harsh and blunt. And how do I make sure that I'm optimistic, but also realistic? And like, how do I think, you know, how do I give people tools? Again, this election season about to be wild in our homes. So how to give, you know, I'm trying to be optimistic and realistic, optimistic, realistic, optimistic, realistic. That's the vibe. Life is suffering, but you do suffer less the more you get to know yourself. If you're feeling lost, look at a mirror and make sure you know who's looking back at you. You won't feel so lost once you do. Born into a wealthier family, you can make so many more mistakes in life. And when you're born poor, you get like one or two before your life is over. And that's really sad to me. Yeah, so I used to be a liberal. I voted for Bernie Sanders in 2016, as much as I regret that now. Um, my family was pretty left wing. Some of the people in my family were like radically left, like would refer to white people as blue eyed, red headed devils, things of that nature. And as I got older, I actually started being really outspoken for BLM. I was supposed to be on a reality show teaching people how to be a BLM activist. At the time, I did a deep dive on BLM and I started to realize all of these lies. So then I took a step back. I'm like, okay, what else am I being lied to about? And I started looking at the Democratic Party and questioning my own loyalty to being on the left. I personally think both sides tend to be racist in different ways. Um, I don't think Fair. the government is on the side of the people in general, yeah. and that's just me being, you know, a radical. Uh, when I was young, I used to jump for joy and say, oh yeah, Obama, black president, that's so amazing. He's the same color as me. But when I started to do more research, one of the biggest things I was confused about is, well, why is he a Democrat? What is a Democrat? I did more research about the Democrat Party, and sure, you guys are going to pop off about the head saying, oh, there's a party switch in the Southern strategy and all these things. Which is true. Which you may say is true. I don't believe it is true at all. You're I understand, right. you know, you may. I don't believe it is true. You're right. It's a belief. But does he know it's not true or does he believe it's not true? I think I'm wrong. Yeah. However, one of the biggest questions I had was why is Obama in the same party as the people that started the KKK, the same people that voted against the Civil Rights Act, the same people that are on the news talking about how black people aren't able to accomplish anything and need to be on welfare and need to be promoted uh, with affirmative action and things of that nature. I also, in terms of, I guess, of my political journey, um, I was uh, raised conservative, actually. Um, and then um, high school became, I guess, sort of apolitical. Uh, and then throughout college, and I guess just throughout my life since then, um, I think I've, I guess, you can call me a progressive, you can call me, you know, socialist, whatever you, um, but um, I guess that's, I guess, in the area of where I fall. Um, you said that you were um, a Bernie fan in 2016, and then you transitioned to being, I guess, more conservative. Um, I caucused for Bernie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I guess, I don't know, to me, Bernie Sanders, um, from what he said to what you think now, what was the the shift? Um, for me, it was socialism because back then I was a very broke college kid and I just had this mentality that everything should be free and I was feeling a bit entitled, like everything should be handed to me because I was black because I was very much in that mentality. As I learned more about free markets, as I learned more about capitalism, I started to appreciate that much more. I started to appreciate small business much more, um, limited government, low regulations. I just started to like that much more. But I would say just more when it comes to economics, I don't agree with him. Reparations are necessary. Oh. I hate the reparations conversation. It's the most exhausting conversation in the whole world because it's so like who suffers the most. And I, it's so interesting to me. Like who suffers the most? Again, like this desire to compare suffering is so hard. It's so weird. Obviously a great injustice was done in this country over and over and over again. Great injustices happen all over the world. I am very upset about them. I don't know how to fix them. And I do think there's probably a way, but I think that jealousy and envy is so strong in this country. It's so strong in people. It's so strong in the world. Like people won't allow healing. And healing doesn't look like a payout, but it does look like some sort of acknowledgement and gesture that is much more real. Sometimes, this is a generalization, sometimes the way like white people 
or talk about reparations to black people who desire reparations, it sounds like they're saying, like, I'm sorry you feel like I hurt you. And then I'm not saying reparations is the answer because, like, again, that's a big, like, government solution. And I don't know how to do those. But it's sometimes when white people talk, it sounds like, I'm sorry you think I hurt you. And I'm like, mm, that's not an apology. Like, you ain't even mad about slavery. I can tell. And there's something about it that makes you go like, cool, bro. I can't trust you. I can't vibe with this energy. You know what I mean? Um, I think there's something about the way people talk about things. Like, literal slavery. It's happening now. There's slavery now around the world. It is horrendous. The idea of taking a person against their will and keeping them trapped. Which is, again, why I'm pretty anti-prisons. Because I think a lot of the reason people end up in jails, like, you know what I'm saying? So I think that's why I dislike when Wick is like, do you think a person can consent to being a slave? I'm like, well, you wouldn't really make them a slave. <laughs> like, in BDSM, when we joke that, like, or not joke, but we role play that masters and slaves not related to racism, um, you can't really consent to being a slave. That's why it's role play. Hello? Pay attention. Is it wrong to keep someone against their will as your slave? Yes. Are they allowed to consent to role playing as your slave? Sure. If they want to leave and you keep them there, is that ethical? No. Because the moment they revoke consent, they can't consent to being a slave. Please think before you say things. Literally. You can consent to being a slave, which is fake, because if you can, you, the moment you don't consent to being the slave, you should be able to leave. You can't say, well, they consented to being my slave, so now they can't leave. What are we even talking about? What are we even talking about? When we talk about reparations, I think that doing reparations in the way that a lot of people think of it, where we just give it to black people, I'm not an expert on this, but I think it would be more income based and that in itself, like I said earlier, uh, would uh, disproportionately benefit black people because if you recognize that they are disproportionately uh, affected uh, by a systemic injustice, then doing it on like a class level would uplift proportionally more black people than white people or think, any other race. Yeah, I think like, the, um Mostly like black GIs that were left out of like the New Deal, for instance, um, that to be able to come back and um, as a white American, as a white veteran to get um, a home loan and then build that generational wealth, um, you could not get that as a black American. Um, so there needs to be, I think reparations, I don't care really what form it comes from. Uh, I think free healthcare, uh, free college so that everyone has like an equal opportunity to, um, uh, to educate themselves, to build a better life for themselves. Um, so it's sort of like, uh, and I think um, Germany is also a perfect model to follow, um, you know, by uh, don't issuing, first of all, a formal apology, uh, which we haven't even done that, um, but also just like uh, um, donating to like different uh, funds and, you know, just I think a more equitable society striving for that is uh, reparations in itself. I have no problems with reparations if they had happened initially during the like slavery or the civil rights movement or any of that but to try and do that now logistically just doesn't really make any sense and like where would this money come from like we're in so much debt <laughs> as a nation would i get this money i'm biracial or triracial like do mixed people get it and like do irish people get reparations when they were indentured servants i think for reparations if you can find specific instances of somebody being like actually deprived of something um whether specific instances of like the 40 acres and a meal process uh promise or whether you can find specific entrance uh, uh cases of like chinese people building railroads or irish people or whatever people being deprived of things that's okay but otherwise Otherwise, yeah, it's a logistical nightmare. There's no possible way that we'd be able to do it well. Yeah, America's unique because we have. OK, so again, so the philosophy part of so the pol politics part of this is reparations is basically saying, hey, I'm acknowledging that we really hurt you and we want to give something back. Right. But I think the philosophy perspective is that your dignity is not going to come from the government apologizing to you. Your dignity comes from within you and you acknowledging that you are allowed to have a dignified life. The government isn't going to dignify you, so you have to dignify yourself. Reparations could be in a form of being dignified. I don't think we value... Mm. 
I don't think we value individual consciousness enough to then value the uniqueness of our skin and our bodies and the way we present. I think because we lump people up in groups, X group looks this way, so X group is this way. We don't and we cannot value people and give dignity to people because people are just stereotypes, whether it's white people or black people or whoever, I don't care, name your group. I think when you start to dignify the individual, you have a much better time of dignifying the consciousness while acknowledging that your biases still exist and no one is above them and that if you're a white man, you're going to have a very specific thing ingrained in who you are because you are that person, you lived your life that way. And if you're a black woman, you've lived your life that way and you have a very specific experience. And if you're uh, an assault victim, you have a very specific experience. And if you worked in the coal mines, you have a very specific experience. And all of us live in different bubbles with different experiences. And they form us in who we are. But deep down, past all of that, there's also all of us, like our core, the person we are when all of that doesn't matter. I think you get to be that person the most when someone can see all of you or like 99% of you. I think when people can't see big parts of you, it's really hard to value you. And so they try to change you so they can value you. But I think you should be able to show dignity by working on seeing people. So one of the reasons I like to bubble hop, one of the reasons I do like to work on humanizing people, even people I'm frustrated with, is because I want to show dignity. I want to give people dignity. I want to dignify myself. And I can't do that if I keep objectifying you and treating you like an evil person. And at the same time, of course I get upset. I have an in, I have an insane sense of like justice. Like I've since I was a child, I would like cry at news stories and I would cry over the silliest, like, why do they hurt each other? And then I, you know, they hurt each other because they don't know what else to do. When you realize you don't have to hurt people back and you have the discipline to not do it, that's a big deal. I'm not perfect at it. Girl, I can cut you so fucking deep. Girl, I am so good at going for people's weak spots. And I try not to, but I ain't perfect and I never said I was, okay? That's why I always say like, man, I really love my mom. She's like one of the most thoughtful, kindest people. When she sees you, she's really, really thoughtful. But man, if if she's triggered or if she wants to insult you, she'll go right for the thing you care about the most. Like she'll go for you, girl. And same. Same. It's why I have to like bite my tongue because, man, sometimes I feel so justified in hurting people, but it's not. It's a feeling. And it takes discipline to act with kindness. It does. It is not easy being a kind person in a world of suffering. So even these people, they're like, um, how hard is it to be kind? Look in a mirror. Ask yourself that question, girl, because, okay, you're not being any more kind than you think other people are being. Bent over backwards for decades now, putting minorities in a position of privilege. I feel like we have done so much to give back to the communities that were obviously wrong. And I agree with both of you. Like, had this happened a long time ago, I would understand it. If we had specific incidences that we could trace where people were just completely screwed over, I would respect it. But right now, I don't deserve a payment for something my great, 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 great grandparents went through. And I don't think that white people are responsible for paying that to me either. I know we don't want to use the word virtue signaling, but it's sort of like a bribe for a vote in a, in a way, at least in my opinion. In states like California, where they've been throwing around the idea of, oh, we want to pay out this much money to every black citizen in there uh, in this state, it's like, are, are you serious? Because this is kind of like a, a joke, in my opinion. I think that if you, if we impose or, yeah, impose reparations now, I think it would rip America apart. I think that we're already separated enough as it is, and now you're going to have people walking around going, you owe me money, you owe me money, I'm not paying you any money. It would just really rip us apart. Giving somebody money doesn't mean anything if they don't know what to do with the money or how to handle the money. So if the primary issue in black culture or with black people is generational trauma, then maybe they need more therapy than they need money, honestly. Which conservatives are also against. Well, that's kind of my exactly. argument. Like, if there is, like, that, like, generational trauma or whatever, like, I think examples of, like, free health care, um, they could see a therapist and not be, you know, fall into debt. And I think the argument of, like, the logistical nightmares of it, I think if we want to pay for something in this country, we usually find a way to do it, especially when it comes to the military. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, I mean, mm -hmm. we pay for multi-billion dollar it's jets not the all the dollars, time. It's who's supposed to get them. Yeah. Not to attack. Mm. See, okay, so maybe like therapy or compassionate therapy could be one of the ways you could give dignified um, reparations. So again, it's not, and I'm talking about the not the politics, but the philosophy. 
Because obviously, like, money is really helpful. And I think money is, um, like, again, rich people are miserable. Wealthy people can feel awful. So we know money, and they've done totally, many studies on this, money doesn't exactly fulfill the consciousness, right? It's just a tool. And I love it. It's a great tool, even though it's a construct. It's like, it's a tool, and we use it, and we, you know. But maybe a more dignified version of reparations would be like therapy. But then therapists are human and not all therapists are good and some therapists are bad because humans can be bad therapists or humans can be bad people who become therapists. So again, you have to be really cautious about what form of therapy, what level of therapy, what level of resource. A lot of people who work with struggling um, economic backgrounds are also burnt out because they're not making the money they should be making because they're in social work. So they are also aren't paying their bills in the same ways. It's really hard not to like feel defeated even when there's programs. So something along these lines though would be nice. But the dilemma is that like people would actually still want to get better and not everybody wants to get better. So the more nuanced and difficult part of this is that the idea is that reparations will heal something and I don't think people heal unless they want to with or without reparations and I think a lot of people and this isn't black people human beings in general on this whole planet aren't ready to heal it's too hard and I don't blame you it's very difficult to let go of anger it's very difficult to move on. It's very difficult to not be afraid. It's very difficult to understand yourself. And so I think like it has to be about you. Reparations is a guy, it's like a nice idea. I think it should be rooted in dignity, but I really do think it's not going to do the healing that I think some people are hoping it will do. I'm not saying we can't have reparations and healing, but I don't think reparations are as healing as they should be. And I think we should be aiming for healing. I progressives, but that that is like the most progressive idea in the world is like, I can see the headlines, like reparations voted on in Congress to be paid in the form of free therapy for people in the hood. That just sounds like the funniest (laughs) thing in the world. But Well, I also don't think it's going to come directly from like, you know, white person to black person. Like, oh, you, you, um, your lineage uh, affected his lineage. It is though. Like in San Francisco, they were going to raise the average family or the average household in San Francisco was expected to pay $600,000 each with the $5 million per black person proposal that they had. And I used to live in the San Francisco Bay Area and I was repulsed by that because you have so many homeless veterans on the streets and they were going to give black people a home for as little as one dollar just for being black mind you slavery wasn't even in california so why that was going to be the case like i don't understand but it's extremely unrealistic to think that the average family in san francisco can afford that that's because newsom wants to get reelected. <laughs> okay but you okay first of all i've met gavin newsom not my favorite um with that mindset it sounds like they'll never find peace i think most people don't find peace most people choose chaos most people choose Most people don't want peace. I am not convinced and I have no evidence. Maybe you have different evidence. I have no evidence that humans, generally speaking, want peace. I see a lot of people openly admitting they want drama and tension and chaos and I don't see no peace, girl. Like I see consistently that people often don't choose peace. Now, peace is difficult because often when you choose peace – you also, you're choosing a very specific path and it doesn't always align with maybe monetary success or maybe um, like certain end goals. So you have to, sometimes peace doesn't work with your plan, but I personally, I'm seeking wisdom and peace and I think I'll fight for that for the rest of my life. I choose peace, you know, in different ways. Like I won't collab with certain people because I'm like, "Mm -mm, I'm choosing peace. But I don't always choose peace. Sometimes I get on panels with people and that's definitely not peaceful. But at the same time, like that's the thing is like I don't think people choose peace. I think people run rat races and they like drama. They like their toxic boyfriends and they like their toxic life. And where's the peace in that? Sense. 
Cause I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 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 dun,